Okay, we will reconvene our meeting. We spent the last two hours between a, a goals workshop session, which we got halfway through. Mm -hmm. So it's good we have another one scheduled in August to complete. And then we had a half hour uh, executive session to discuss personnel and potential legal matters. So getting to our agenda. And John, I'm assuming we should um, switch the agenda around. You want to take um, we'll take the, Leah. Take the that, survey. That's that's. So you skip, we'll skip the SSBC update. Right. Sure. Okay. So first we'll do the we don't any public input. <laughs> oh please, Rita, I'm begging you. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, student report we don't have in the summer, and then uh, let's hit an update on the uh, secondary school building project, which I know everybody thinks is complete, but. It's still not complete, Ms. Bernard. Got now? Yep. So in your report, I, I've identified a few things that um, I think are noteworthy. The first is um, the uh, drainage repairs um, for the main access road were deemed to be um, successful, and notification of that was provided to us on June 27th. Again, we haven't met for, um, or you haven't met since June 19th, so there's been a lot uh, in between. Um, that subsequently led to the um, paving of the access road last Thursday and Friday. <clears throat> the 20th and 21st of July. The striping of the road is to is scheduled to take place on Wednesday and Thursday of this week, July 26th and 27th, obviously uh, weather permitting. There have been a number of trees um, replaced around the campus. Um, there are still some shrub replacements to be addressed. I did identify at the last um, secondary school building committee where I thought those needed to be uh, needed to take place. And uh, Chip Highcamp from Dorn Whittier, I think, took note of the particularly the two. Uh, mound areas on the front and rear plazas. And we also were able to, um, and I appreciate Gil Bain's cooperation in agreeing to some more hydro seeding, um, particularly in the area of the connecting bridge that comes from Main Street over to uh, this portion of the campus um, on the sloped area. A pretty significant area where um, the grass actually has taken more than I might have thought it would in, the, in kind of the heat of the summer, but um, be that as it may, there are still a number of bare spots that will be hydro seeded. Right now, the target date for that is August 11th. Um, I have asked for, and unfortunately I have not received um, for tonight, um, a report from uh, Gilbane on the outstanding items to be addressed in the punch list, uh, but according to the report from PMA at the last secondary school building committee that uh, that list continues to be whittled down, but I was hoping to be able to provide you with a more specific list of what is still remaining, but I do not have that. Um, I did uh, have a meeting with um, Auckers. I wasn't able to give you any specific information about the audiovisual upgrades because um, they were scheduled to take place um, last week and I needed to prepare the report for you, but I can tell you that Auckers continues to be um, extremely uh, cooperative in addressing our concerns. Um, we had a pretty significant upgrade to the projector unit in the Performing Arts Center um, that went very well. We have a test, we had a test of a new projector for this room. Um, you might recall that we had, this is a replacement of the same style of projector, which was uh, a significant upgrade, but they brought in a laser projector for us to, uh, to test, and I can tell you the improvement, it, it's, it's 10 times as good as what's on the screen right now. It was, it was amazing how much clearer and brighter and sharper it was, even with the shades of the windows open. Um, so that's something that we're considering as an upgrade. They have done a, a substantial amount of work um, troubleshooting some issues that we had with um, the operations of the system. Again, I can't uh, say enough that I'm very pleased with their, um, their response to our, to our concerns. We've also processed the purchase of the microphones that we had committed through the Walter Flint Memorial Fund as well as the uh, facility use funds. Um, that, that order was placed, uh, would you say, probably the end of June, um, Michael, Yeah, end of the school year. A month ago. So we think among the upgrades there are microphones that um, don't, you don't need to be speaking right on them or into them, um, much like we see in the Performing Arts Center, that they have a little bit more of a broader range. So you, if you turn your head, the idea is you wouldn't lose volume. You don't need to be standing right over the microphone, as well as a system that will allow us to eliminate one of the microphones for town meeting, and therefore we can be using one, one microphone that will be both for the um, internal audio, that is for people in the audience at town meeting, as well as um, for NORCAM. So we think that that's a, a good upgrade. We're not going to be running around with the two microphones, much like we have been doing. So um, that should be in place for October town meeting. 
as well as um, just over, overall upgrades for any other uses of the Performing Arts Center outside of town meeting. And I believe that's all I have for you, Mr. Chairman. Not, not related to the building project, but I just something that came up, I think, in tandem to a report <coughs> on the building project was about the striping uh, of the parking lots and other, you know, kind of the uh, crosswalks and other zones of this campus. We also extended that. We are going to be doing some work this summer at all of our schools to um, identify kind of the caution zones, the yellow curbings and such, as well as I think, Mr. Webster, you brought up about the striping. Uh, of this campus, um, and that will be taking place before school starts in September. Now, we are we 100 percent responsible for the cost yes. on that? Is a shared, not a shared cost, or with the building project? No, with any any of the schools. No, we we're, do we're we're doing it as a district okay. a district cost. Okay. Any questions on the question. Julie? As far as the upgrades specifically for the Performing Arts Center, AV, yeah. What? Are we responsible for financially for those upgrades? Yeah, that's a very good question. I have to tell you right now, right now, very little. Ockers, um, the original meeting that they requested back, mm, boy, I don't know, it's, it's quite a while ago, six or so months ago, was about them, um, I'll, I'll use the phrase, restoring their reputation. Um, the way they tell it, they, um, they felt like they wanted to address issues that they knew were in existence back when Ostro was on, the electrical contract was on the job, but felt that they were uh, prohibited from doing so. And once Ostro was gone from the job, reached out to Patrick Daly and to me and asked for a meeting to discuss what they thought needed to be done and to also entertain any other concerns that we had. So consequently, they're, they're right now I would say they're in, the, uh, they're in the kind of the customer service, customer satisfaction phase. Um, they are making some recommendations to us on things that they think would be you know, more useful. The, for example, if we decided to go with the laser projector in this room, that would be a cost we would incur. It was, you know, th this is specified as part of the job. Yep. But they, they have been pretty good about, they replaced a, um, a DVD player in the Performing Arts Center. They upgraded. Um, they think, they thought that that should have been, you know, a better, better quality DVD player for that, for that space. Um, as well as they've done a lot of just like, I'll say little minor things, adjustments that eliminated crackling in the sound system, things that they saw that they thought were, you know, connections that they didn't think were as, as strong or as sturdy as they thought. There's kind of a whole control unit up in the, uh, in the control booth of the Performing Arts Center up top that <clears throat> they, you know, a very simple fix, they, they, they're mounting that as opposed to it being a free moving rack. And because of that, if it gets moved, cables in the back, you know, either come out or come out partially and therefore compromise the quality. So there's a lot of little things like that. Um, pretty expensive projector in the Performing Arts Center control booth that they've encased with a ventilated box to protect it because when people are up there walking by, it's, it's so huge, it's a big projector as you might imagine. Um, but they felt like that that was something that would protect and therefore preserve the projector. Things like that have been no cost to us okay. right now. This is highly unusual. This is a subcontractor right. that did this on their own initiative. I mean, um, I don't think that's right. that kind of cooperation from any of the subcontractors certainly. I, I think you could say that. Or the, the general contractor. They, they've been out here, I would say, no fewer than eight times. So they put in some time. Yeah, they've been very, very good. And it, these were the tweaks that needed to be done, too. I mean, they were necessary and probably beyond the warranty period, too, uh, oh, as far yeah, as getting these so. things done. Yeah. No, as you say, they're, they're probably one of the, if not the Always. subcontractor that we've gotten the most, I'd say, customer satisfaction from. Any other questions or comments on the school building project? Well, John, the only thing I want to suggest is, again, if you're talking to Joanna, to try to keep, uh, uh, keep on them about the parking lot situation. Yes, I will. Yeah, I will. Okay, next we have a presentation. We have Amy Luckowitz and Leah Myos here, and they're going to give us the results of the Pride survey. Really, Leah, show. Leah. Um, Michael, you want to put the microphone up there? You so want, you yes. Yeah. 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 I'll move to my regular spot. So maybe, Mr. Chairman, as you all get into your spots to view the presentation just by way of an introduction, I just recall that uh, back in the uh, late winter, we had come to you, Leah had come to you, I think it was a meeting at the Batchelder School, seeking um, the blessing of the committee to administer the Pride survey to students in grades 6 through 12. That was done early spring. And so what Leah is here tonight to do is to provide you with kind of a general overview of the, mm -hmm. the, the salient points of, uh, of the data. Pretty much. And talk a little bit about what plans uh, she has and what work the CIT, may, Community Impact Team, may be doing in the next uh, year plus to, to try and 
reduce some of the, the numbers that you're going to see tonight. And actually, before she gets started, I should note that uh, we have Chief Murphy here from the police department and Rita Mullen from the community impact team are also here tonight. Rita, you're not going to speak, guys. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Webster. I appreciate all you've done for us. Hi again, I'm Leah um, from the Community Impact Team and I'm the project coordinator for the Drug Free Communities Federal Grant. So again, like John had mentioned, this was a survey that we had conducted in February and we have the results of it that I'm going to talk about today. So, um, and the, it was middle school and high school that the survey was administered to and we focused on substances that were alcohol, tobacco, and prescription drugs. And we tried to pull out positive points of the data as opposed to you know who is using the most. We tried to look at who wasn't using. So those were some positive things. And then we also did an online survey that John helped us send out. Um, and it was 183 surveys that were completed. 113 were from high school parents, and then 70 were from middle school parents. And we had that survey opened from March to May. So these are some of the goals that we have. Um, and we were looking to, again, gather information on the four substances listed, and they were referred to as ATOD, which is, again, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. And we used some national data, which was used, it was monitoring the future study, and then we compared it to our North Reading data. And, and again, we're required to report on these four substances, which, again, are listed above and part of the federal grant. So this is student past 30 day non-use, and this is the percentage of students who didn't use in the past 30 days. So again, we were really trying to highlight the high numbers, and there are quite a, there is quite a range and quite a lot of high numbers, and the 100% of, is of course non-use. You, you said the number of parents. Do you have the number of students who responded, or was that number you gave us students? The, um, it was parents originally, and then it was, I think there was only, I, I don't know exactly what the number was, but we did have, have pretty good turnout right. for students. There was some missing, but I want to say it was under 100 that, weren't e that were either not completed or we couldn't use the data from, um, just based on what was on the scan sheet. So. And who did we, just who did we survey? What, what grade, did we survey all grades in the high school? Six, middle school? Well, yeah, middle school and high school, so six through 12. Okay. And so sixth graders and eighth graders reported the highest percentage of non-use, and you can look, the grades are up the top, and then the substances are on the left. And 12th graders reported the lowest percentage of non-use across all substances when compared to all grades. This next slide is um, parents' perception of child's past 30-day non-use. So this is what, how their parents perceive their child using. And the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade parents reported 100% perception of non-use across all substances. So that's meaning that they had the lowest perceived use. And parents of 12th grade students had the lowest perception of non-use across all substances, meaning 12th graders had the highest perception of perceived use. And again, this is what the, this is part of the parents' survey, so how they felt. This is students' perception of risk or harm. And this is the percentage of students who said they perceived using substances as a moderate <coughs> or great risk. And tobacco was reported highest as having the moderate or great risk by eighth graders. And then marijuana was reported lowest as having moderate or great risk by 12th graders. So those are kind of the high and low points that we picked out. This is the parent perception of risk or harm. And this is the percent of parents who perceive their child using the substance as moderate or great risk. So similar to um, the last one, this is the parent's perception. We recognize there are, there are many duplicate numbers, um, but we did actually recalculate the data, so we're not exactly sure if that's something on Pride's end, but we do realize that there are quite a few duplicate numbers. And seventh grade parents perceive prescription drug use as lowest rank substance for moderate or great risk. And then eighth, ninth, and tenth grade parents perceive tobacco, marijuana, and prescription drugs as the highest rank substances, substances for moderate or great risk. So again, those are kind of the high points that we're picking out. So 
So this was the student's perception of their parents' disapproval. So this was, again, surveying the students of how they felt their parents felt about their drug use. Um, and it, it, it's the term is wrong or very wrong. So if their parents would perceive that their use was wrong or very wrong. And alcohol is actually the only substance on here that's not recorded at 100% disapproval rate, meaning that their uh, students didn't think that their parents fully disapproved at up to 100%. Um, and that was across all grades. And then prescription drugs had the highest parent disapproval rate according to students. So students feel like the parents would most disapprove of prescription drugs and most accept, in a sense, um, alcohol use. This is student perception of accessibility. And this is the percent of students who perceive substances as fairly easy or easy to get. And marijuana was reported as the least accessible substance at 2.8% accessibility, which was reported by seventh graders. And then alcohol was reported as the easiest substance to obtain across grade levels. It was all grade levels. And 65.9% of 12th graders reported it was easy or very easy to get. And that's a pretty high number, that it's, it's pretty accessible to 12th graders. And then 8% of 6th graders reported that alcohol was very easy or easy to get <coughs> and was reported, reported as the most accessible substance use in the 6th grade, or accessible substance. And again, those are kind of the high and low points. This, was, this slide was interesting. This was about where students use substances. So we tracked different locations. Um, and unfortunately, there is another category, but we don't know what that contains. So out of those, the top two places to use substances on average across all grade levels. Um, and we looked at all of the reported data, and then we picked out the top two. So a friend's house was reported as the most popular place to use substances. And that was, again, across all grade levels. And it was at 17.7%. And that is really quite the highest. It's such a jump from the other ones. Um, and then alcohol was reported as the highest percentage of use. So out of all of the drugs that where they were used in the top two places, alcohol was the highest percentage of those four substances that, were, that we were tracking. And then again, like I had mentioned, um, other, so other for prescription drugs was reported lowest, but we again don't have that additional information where that location was. And then Prescription drugs are the only substance reported being used in the school um, as in, in the most popular place category. So that's the only area that had a one or a two when it was prescription drugs for the school. And then um, there were all substances used, they were reported as being used at school. So, and these were all, all of the substances were reported in kind of all of these categories, but again, these were just the top two. So this is what I had mentioned briefly in the beginning. This is North Reading data versus national past 30 day percent non-use. And this was again from the Monitoring the Future study. And the data was only collected in eighth, 10th, eighth, 10th and 12th grade. So you'll see at the top, it's eighth grade, 10th grade, and 12th grade. And North Reading substance use reported as higher than the national average when data was available, except the alcohol use for 10th and 12th grades, and then marijuana use among 12th graders. So those are pretty much the high points of um, the pride surveys that we had conducted. And next, we just have some um, next steps. And I'm just gonna point out a few of them that are on here. And in, in the handouts that you guys have in front of you, the first page is the seven strategies for community change. Um, that's just what I'm going to point out. So that's when we're going to work on using more effectively to implement the prevention strategies based on this survey data. Or I'm sorry, it's after the slides. It's the first handout after the slides. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry, it's a separate packet. Do you all have yours? <clears throat> and then we're also planning to partner with schools to increase their protective factors um, and decrease risk factors, and that's the second page of the handout. And those are just some examples of both. And then so the other thing we're going to do is uh, refocus the 12-month action plan to include more heavily alcohol. So when we originally did it, we didn't focus too, too much on alcohol. That was still one of the drugs that were focused on, but we just realized how high, uh, how high of a percentage there is of alcohol use in 12th grade and across all grades. So that's something we're going to 
look into and try to do more prevention strategies off of. Some additional next steps, um, just in terms of the survey itself, we're going to present the pride data to the Board of Selectmen on September 5th, and then we're going to eventually do a NORCAM taping in August to get these results out as well. And then we're going to partner with the NRPS Health Education to provide data that can help support curriculum. And we are in the process of um, getting some curricular cur curriculum to one of the health teachers um, to, ha you know, to work that into the health education. few conclusions so based on the data we saw that use really peaks at grade 12 and 93.1 percent of students see tobacco as the most harm harmful substance which was interesting and then 27.3 percent of students see marijuana as the least sub least harmful substance so again those are some highs and lows that we picked out A few more. As students age, the perception of parental disappro disapproval of substance use declines, which we had seen in a couple of the slides. And again, alcohol was reported as the easiest substance to obtain, and it was across all grade levels. And then the 65.9% of 12th graders who reported it was easy or very easy to get, which again is a pretty high number. And just to reiterate, the most popular place to use substances is at a friend's house. So that was something that was interesting as well, that just when we looked at where the use was actually going on and it was pretty high at a friend's house. So that's all I have for this piece. And then um, there are the handouts and then you guys have the slides in front of you, but are there any questions I can answer for the board right now or? Thank you. Um, so I just have two quick questions okay. um, or a suggestion. Number one, did you not, uh, I'm guessing this is all you asked about, but did you not ask where they're actually getting it from? You asked where it's being used, but not where it's, who's providing them? Yep, and that's one of the questions. So we used a survey that was already kind of pre-populated all the questions. There was a section that we could do 10 additional questions. And we are looking at that to do that for the next year because this was our first time doing it. So it was a work in progress. So it is, that's exactly what we realized that we need that question to maybe add in and it would be hard to kind of narrow down because we could only give them so many answers. But yes, that is a great point that we need to include that. Okay, and then and then particularly since we're the school committee, two of the next steps we're partnering with the school. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned you were going to talk to a, one of the health teachers. Are there are there other ways in which you think the school can be of assistance with this? Um, I think we're, we are still working on that. We are planning on doing a workshop, which is guiding good choices, and we're partnering with the, partnering with the school. Um, so that could be something that's helpful, and it's working with families to also kind of talk about substance use and how to talk to your kids and families alike. Um, so we're doing that, and then we're also just going to try to plan to do the survey again to administer it again to get more results. Um, but we are those are that's another thing we're working on to kind of see where we can get our resources and what we can do with them. So thank you. Yes. Um, just to follow up on that question. Uh, Reed and I just came from a youth services meeting where we met with all three of the elementary school uh, principals, which was a great opportunity for us because typically we work mostly with middle school and high school. And I think Chief Murphy would agree with this, that an opportunity really lies with uh, earlier education around this uh, topic. We have a pretty decent grant going on here, and we are willing to invest that in whatever it takes to have um, a captive audience. And that captive audience mostly takes place at the schools. Understanding that the teachers and the principals are asked an awful lot to cram a lot of curriculum in a short period of time. We understand that. But are there some natural opportunities where we could perhaps um, hire a contractor to come in and teach, I don't want to use this term, but like a DARE-like program, where we would be funding that through the DFC um, entirely, but have make sure that it's uh, uniform across all three elementary schools. I think that that would be really important. When we're talking to the... Um, principals today they seemed open to the concept provided that the schedule allowed for that so I think that's something we'll be looking at for year two by the way year two for us begins October 1 um, so just throwing that out there um, Leah had mentioned that we are providing some curriculum opportunities for a health teacher and that health teacher is in the middle school so we're providing specifically and I'm sure you'll get the um, donation request coming soon around two thousand dollars of equipment 
and that equipment includes things like um, marijuana goggles and really tangible interactive pieces for the middle school level. So those are some really specific things. However, we obviously love the health department here and um, you know we're really big advocates of anything that is around increasing those protective factors. Um, helping students with their refusal skills. Claudia Brown would love this conversation right now. Um, any way that we can support that at a bigger scale, you know, having, having um, the state supports that curriculum and making sure that that's part of the curriculum at a younger age. I think that the high school does a great job of that, but unfortunately I would, I, I would personally love to see that at a younger age, you know, not just uh, middle school, but even perhaps in the elementary school. So how can we introduce that at an age appropriate level? You know, talking about, um, Dating situations perhaps might not be an appropriate conversation at the elementary level, but can we introduce general concepts around refusal skills and um, increasing protective factors? So I hope that answered that a little bit more clearly, specifically. But um, any opportunities that, you know, this committee, I know you're in a planning session right now, if you can identify that where the DFC grant could help you out with that, we're open to that conversation. Mr. Bernard and I were talking about Parent University. There's an opportunity there certainly for us to partner. Um, that was on our 12-month action plan, and I know that's on Mr. Bernard's plan, so that was a great thing to come up. Screenagers is another thing that Mr. Bernard had an idea about, and we're like, well, are you thinking about that? Let's figure that out together. So anything that comes up in your planning process, write it down, and, you know, Mr. Bernard talks to us almost daily, I think, sometimes. <laughs> pretty regular. Yeah, pretty regular, so um, we're happy to help out with that. I had a question. Um, I was a little surprised, and this is, I guess, for everybody, including Chief. I was a little surprised at the well, we had a much lower non-use percentage rate at the 12th grade for both alcohol and marijuana. So I'm looking at that and I'm saying, is it the demographics of the town because North Reading's a well-off town? And uh, what, I, I was just surprised at that. Or is it just because this is the first time we've done the survey and it's not, we don't have years of data? I, I guess I was surprised at that. Can we flip to the slide, Leah? Is the first one there? No, it was when you compared to the, oh, compared to the national, the comparison. That um, I think it was right near the end. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that one right. Oh, yeah. That, okay. yeah, that one right there. I mean, you see, like with alcohol, f only 48 percent had non-use the past three days, and 66 national in the marijuana. I mean, I was just wondering, well, could it be a one-time thing? Yeah, I mean, we're gonna in the next survey. I think would either solidify these numbers or maybe an anomaly of this particular class, we're just not sure. But I ask that because we seem to have, I know we do have an opioid, like every town there's an opioid problem, but we seem to have a better handle on it than some of the surrounding communities. If you look at the number of deaths, number of overdoses, et cetera. So that kind of surprised me. Well, I yeah, I don't know that I totally agree with what you said only because um, you don't, we don't give data out on overdoses, mm -hmm. so to speak, but ours is pretty consistent based upon the population in our town. Right. Um, with you know the larger cities, it, it's pretty consistent the percentages wise. Oh. So um, you know it's just probably not something that gets publicized. But our our opiate problem is the same as the next town, the state, and pretty much the whole country. So we're we're right on par with that. Um, you know th this, as you can see, there's no data on. It looks like it's just prescription use. I wish we could actually just test specifically on opiates, that, right? Because that would—I mean—that's obviously our biggest prescription drug problem right, right now. Um, that's affecting obviously people's lives. Um, so, I mean, I, I look at this though, and I—I I, I guess the biggest number to me is the marijuana use. Yeah. Um, and I and I look at the perceptions from what the parents perceive their kids' use is, and then and then the kids' actual use. And, would have loved to have done this before this was legalized last year, just to see how much just the legalization impact Spiking. was yeah. on the use. Yeah. Because I would say it, it's, I mean, we're guessing, but I would say that it definitely spiked the use. Yeah. Because, you know, essentially it's, if it's legal, it can't be bad for you. But then we look at tobacco, which is legal, but there's the perception that it's really, really bad for. Of course, us. we've had after that campaign over the years, it had the commercials and you know. Well, I guess I guess that's where we look at all of these other things too. Is there has been that campaign against tobacco? Right. And we've talked about this in our last meeting. Is that's what we need to get out on all of these drugs, because zero percent is what we need. Right. And you know, I think that that's where you know we we talk about our little group here. 
we've been advocating with the DA's office and anybody we can talk to about the Board of Education actually coming out with mandated uh, curriculum for everybody across the, across the state. No, I don't know if it would ever happen, but we could certainly use some sort of support to try to start to push that agenda too, because you guys can only do what you can do. You have only so much time to fit whatever it is we can fit. Right. Um, we can't, we don't like to see an option. We we wanted to see it be mandated because it gives everybody at least a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because a lot of times when I deal with kids, it's after the fact and it's hard to, you know, now go back in time. But right. you know, I think the early education, obviously, based upon what we see, is is critical. On your point is it'll be interesting to see when we do this the next time what what kind of numbers we get. But I do think the legalization had a, had an impact on it. Gary, I just had one quick question. Just to clarify this for me, on page four, the student perception of accessibility, it appears that from the high school, nine through 12, they perceive obtaining marijuana easier than obtaining tobacco. Am I reading that right? Or? Um. Yes. I mean, I find that I fought as a follow-up to it. Yeah. That seems yeah. unusual that it would be easier to get marijuana than it would be to get tobacco. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you could, yeah, you can. The, the other thing is we don't know who's actually seeking tobacco, though. So, you know, that, that's where this survey really does, you know, it's just a survey. But you know, how many kids are actually looking? We know that there's vaping going on. But how many kids are actually looking to get tobacco at this point? And how many are actually looking to get marijuana? So I think that all has to come into play, and we never get an accurate number on that. Well, the other thing is, Jerry, too, is that if you go into a store, if they're enforcing the eight, isn't it 18 now, the law? 21. It's 21. 21. Okay, I thought it was 18. It should be 18. Rita? If I, can respond to that, if I can respond to that, though, you're right, exactly what you said. If you're going to buy tobacco, you have to go to the store to get it. Right. You usually don't go to the drug dealer down the street <laughs> at, at her house. <laughs> at your now, at your friend's house or the school or the parks, exactly. wherever you get it. Right. They'll sell to anybody. Right. So I think that's a pretty honest answer, to be honest with you. I mean, you have to go to a real store to buy tobacco right. product. You can't just see your buddy at Ipswich or a park. Well, yeah, most of the kids yeah. don't have, they have the, all their weed, but they don't have Marlboro and right. Lucky Strike. And exactly. The, the, the can I add into that? Um, Chief had mentioned related to the uh, the tobacco use is that you know we saw a major drop when there was advertising against it, but another really significant um, factor was when we Im and imposed higher taxes on it. They saw a direct correlation nationally to an increase of taxes, by the way, which can be regulated locally and at the state level as well, to a decrease in use. We saw that, um, which is an interesting conversation right now as our state has just decided about what the taxation is going to be on marijuana. So the higher the taxes, the lower the use. We know that correlation exists, not just advertising. It's a really big factor, and we can't underestimate that. The other thing I just want to add is um, related to that perception of use. Um, this is a community issue, and you had asked about that 12th grade number. We know anecdotally that there is a casual attitude about alcohol use in this town. We know that. I'm not speaking just in high school, I'm saying in general, um, whether it be in the leagues, things that you know Rita works on. We know that. We have that somewhat documented, somewhat don't, to be honest with you. This is a community issue, and the community needs to decide, is almost 52% of our 12th graders using alcohol acceptable? The community needs to decide that. And if you're in this room saying no, then it's kind of self-evident about what we need to focus on. But we know that there's a lot of public no's and a lot of private yeses. And we know that through parties that the police have to break up. We know that through um, the text messages. We know that through where kids are posting on social media where they were that weekend holding a solo cup. We know that anecdotally. It's very difficult to track. But this is a community issue and one that you know I think the CIT and the schools are really primed to partner with. Also with the police, also with leagues, also with parent groups, all, with everybody across the board. So the more people that can become aware of this, and that's why we're really looking forward to bringing this information publicly, and to say this is not a school problem, this is not a police problem, this is not a youth services problem, this is our problem. And if our unified answer to that question about 52% or a little bit more of our seniors using alcohol is not acceptable, then we can move forward there. But when uh, we have that differentiation of publicly saying yes, that's a problem, and privately saying no is where we struggle. And I think that um, you know this time of year or the last six weeks is the most difficult with the graduation parties, the high school graduation parties. And I, I'm not a prude, and neither is my wife, but I'm always amazed when we'll go to a graduation party. And, <laughs> and I'm like, what the heck? Well, may I, I just mention that we are pursuing um, for town meeting a uh, social host ordinance, 
which is different than social host liability. Um, that's a civil fine. This will be something where the police can have a little bit more power in, in, in uh, issuing fines. So we're looking forward to that. We've seen that being effective in other communities that are similar to ours. Um, but there's been discussion about is a fine going to be enough, you know, up to $300. Is that really going to make an impact? Or are these, does that have to be public? That Rita Mullen hosted a party, and you know what? She got, she got cited with that. Her so. parties are great, though. <laughs> Her parties are great. <laughs> uh, so there's been some really interesting discussion, and I just um, encourage everybody to town ten, attend town meeting. That's separate than the ordinance that we already have. Social host ordinance is a civil matter. This will be allowing the police to issue fines. Yeah, I think the three hundred dollar fine isn't a big deal, but making it public is that's the general deal. consensus. Yeah. And I think it's what what you just said is every one of us have gone to a lot of graduation parties. Right. Like you said. And I wind up leaving early every time I go. Excited that you're going, but when I see the sixteen year old kids and seventeen year old kids, like they said, walking around with a red cup and that the parents are allowing it because it's their graduation party and the young kids there. If you're the only one that keeps saying, you know, uh, it, 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 it's, all, you know it, it's all right, because you, you stay there, you stay there and enjoy it and you talk to the kids that have the cup. I can't do it, I have to leave, so, because to stay there means I think it's okay. And I think if you have this social ordinance one, you're now telling the town that you're not supposed to do it. And I just recently went through a, a town that, uh, I don't know if it was their school or their youth service, but they had those paintings, the signs you stick in the ground that say, and it was this social host they talked about in their thing, remember, the social host law, and it was something like, you know, say if you help, you're not helping your children to host the parties. It, and it was, you know, something that basically said it. So I go, oh my God, the town's saying it. So you may feel kind of silly the next time they do invite you, or invite you, or invite you, and they're allowing the kids to drink at the parties. It's, it's, it's becoming acceptable. And if our town is the first one to say it's not, and, and I go back to when we cut the, one of the things we were talking about earlier with these uh, principals there, that I would love to see the health teacher, the dear teacher back, like we had it when they were in this third, fourth grade that the police went in and talked about them. Because you'll still meet kids today, because I've been on youth service committees for 30 years, or the original dear that they had it, that you still see kids today and they repeat things that we talked about mm -hmm. in those days. And just like when they cut the music and the arts in the school, that all of a sudden you notice the band dropped off and how pathetic it was when you saw four or five poor little band kids. Yeah. And it was, what are we doing wrong? And then they added it back in and they said, you're not gonna see it immediately. It's gonna take five or six years. And sure enough, you did. You saw the right. band come back. Yep. What she, Amy said about the smoking, when they did all the advertising nationally, about what smoking does to your health, that kids stopped and the tobacco sales went down, so the, they had to market it and find a different way, so now they're into the vaping and this and that. I think if our town can be the first to try to in, intelligently work it into the schools, but you say it's not just, it's not a school problem, it's not a police problem, it's the parents that also come to league games, and they've done it at high schools, they've done it at the parks, they come to lead, you know, with Red Solo Cup night. And they've done it at different ones that we have to every once in a while send people out and let us out and remind them not to do it. Mm. If you say that it's okay, like you go to these games and you see these things and you don't say anything, then people think it's okay. But if we start to, it's the parents that have to do something about it. We have to let the parents know it's not cool. Yep. And there aren't too many parents that are gonna say to the host, it's all right. They're not gonna say that. Well, I think that the data the fact that the highest percentage of students that this is taking place at a friend's house, whether there's a party happening or parents are working and kids are you know, not supervised, I mean, I think that, again, you know, tells us that you know, something should be done. But they're home. They are home. Right. Well, to that point on that next survey question, that might be one of the follow-up questions. When you're having these in-home drinking, whatever, even if it's one person, are the parents home or not? I think that would be telling. But I think it's telling when they're 16 year old, when they have the birthday parties for the 16 year olds and 17 year olds, and the next day the parents wind up with the beer cans all around, and that same parent allows another party the next week and the next week and the next week for different things. The parents do know. I, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and know that we have a lot of parents in town that don't think it's that bad. And they allow it because they'll take the keys or they do this and they let them sleep over. If the, unless you've sent out a letter to everybody that you invited to the party saying, by the way, I'm gonna allow people to drink at my house, 
and I'm going to ask him to take the keys. You don't know that your parent, your child's going to a, a house of the party, you know, is allowing to do it. Your parents are allowing the kid to do it again. I'll stay upstairs so I don't go down and find him. And I'm sure the chief can tell you nightmare stories about the parents that he fights with, that when something does happen, then they go to him, and the parents say, no, not my kid. Or the parents say, we're going to let you go away yeah. and try not to worry about what you're going to find. <laughs> right. That's the big problem. Right. Um, Any other comments? That's all I have, and I just wanted to mention in the um, packet I did give to all of you, we have National Night Out coming up on August 1st, so it's just a community-wide event, and we're involving law enforcement, so Chief Murphy, all those um, people, and then the community just to bring people together and kind of work on some stuff together, so. Mr. Bernard. Just a comment, if I could, Mr. Chairman. I just want to publicly thank um, Leah and Amy and Chief Murphy for the work that they do, um, whether it's through youth services or through the community impact team or both, uh, with the schools. We benefit a great deal. Mr. Buckley asked about you know what things that we might be able to do. There's a lot going on in our schools. Both the community impact team and youth services are very, I think, fully integrated in our schools, but obviously there's more work to be done. But I think the good thing about both organizations, community impact team and youth services, is that we're always looking at what we might be able to do uh, differently or, or more, and I think the grant acquisition he was significant, there's no doubt about it, and Leah has been um, you know, doing some nice work to try and integrate herself into the schools and into the community and kind of identify where the, where the weak spots are, and kind of we're, we're now in the, kind of the recommendation stage, looking at things that we need to do, uh, either extending work that we're already doing, but now we have the resources to do that, and I think that's become very refreshing, I'll say for me, as someone who sits on the CIT board and works with with all of these folks and others, reader of course too, um, you know we're excited. We're, we're I think in some ways we're kind of you know dissatisfied or displeased that we even have to be addressing these kinds of things. But I see them as you know these are opportunities, and we now have resources behind us to to, to really I think make an impact. So it'll be very interesting to me when we administer the Pride or a similar survey in a year plus time somewhere you know whatever we I guess we were saying next spring. Fall of 18, thank you. Oh, that's right, too. Thank you. Thank you. Fall of 18. It'll be interesting is now that we have some good benchmark data to kind of measure our successes you know, along the way, I hope, with the work that we're going to be doing over the, the course of the next year plus. To Chief Murphy's point, um, you know, we don't want to ignore alcohol, um, marijuana abuse, et cetera, but what about the opioid, opioid issue? I, I, don't, I know I don't think it's this grant specifically referred to opioids, correct? It's the four, correct, Amy? There's the four areas only that the grant can support? Yeah, the um, prescription drugs is the, is including opioids. Could we be more specific? Yeah. It includes Adderall, we, yeah. We, we talked yeah. about yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So that will be the next step. Um, to be honest with you, and Chief can chime in on this, our um, anecdotal evidence is showing that um, overdoses related to opiates are not happening at the 18 level. It's happening really around the late 20s and mid 30s. Um, but we're trying to get that before that. So if kids are starting to experiment with Adderall, uh, Park 30s early on, then that's where we can kind of see that data. Do you want to add anything no, to I, that? No, I agree. It's, it, it, do, it doesn't just go to opiates. I mean, there's a progression, whether it's marijuana, um, or Adderall or other, you know, lower prescription drugs. So, and typically, you know, they just get them out of the medicine cabinet, unused prescription drugs that are just right. sitting there. Um, so, I, and, and, you know, they certainly sample with, you know, their other friends and whatnot. Um, but the opiates, you know, there's a progress, progression there at some point. Um, you know, we, we just can't pinpoint. So I don't know if we necessarily need to pinpoint as well because I think we had done a survey and we did ask specifically about opiates and the data was just all over the place. It was it was either low, and it was giving us a false reading of actually what was happening. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how we would do that because you you go on forever. You know, naming each prescription right. drug, and you know, marijuana is simple, <laughs> marijuana and alcohol is simple. It's alcohol. So, um, you know, the, the prescription drug. And we've talked about that. How do we how do we know where we should be targeting? But but the bottom line is prescription drugs, unless it's prescribed to you. Um, you should not be taking it, and that's kind of where we need to to set that you know that uh, benchmark and go from there. Where I would like to see some things separated out though is around um, edibles, right. first of all, um, and vaping, and also vaping marijuana. Right. So those are some areas where we could do some more breakout to learn that because that uh, that tobacco number includes vaping, but I I really would like to see more of a breakdown on that as well. 
Um, I don't think in our town we see that much of um, chewing tobacco necessarily at this age, at the younger ages, but I'd like to see that broken out too. And certainly the edibles um, that are accessible over the internet that are laced with marijuana, we really need to look at that seriously. That's so easy to get, you know, with a gift card that you have, you know, a Visa gift card that you got for graduating eighth grade, and you can buy it online. It, it's, it's ridiculous. Well, watch the kids get putting on weight. Anything else? Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thanks for your Can we ask for your support at the, uh, yeah. when we get ready with the warrant article? Uh, he did help me. Thank you. On the, uh, the ordinance, social host. Ordinance. Oh, thank you. It would be a good message, I think, so that at least the, that you'd want to just, yeah, was oh, that's what I'm saying. I think yeah. when we get closer, that at yeah. least if the school committee yes. thank debated you. it, and if you came out and said I thought it was a good idea. Yeah, if you're gonna do that ordinance, I would say come here, we would like present it to us so that we, we can Yeah, we would like time on that. Okay. Recommendation. And okay, I think, thank you. Hi. And I thank, thank yeah, you folks. I think publicly, <laughs> publicly help. Yes, thank I'm you. I'm sit down now. <laughs> Leah, can you put that on your calendar with Amy that we ask to come for presentation? Once we get closer on the ordinance. On the ordinance, yeah. The school committee. Yes. Is that yep. something that we'd like to obviously review and hopefully make a recommendation on if you're going to ask? Sure. To put that on yeah, and I'm actually working with the legal counsel right now. Okay. And so it's technically a bylaw. Yeah. Um, and I'm working with the legal counsel, and we just got the first draft back, and then I'm hoping to finalize it. Um, but we can't. I guess it's very specific as yeah. to what we can even do. Yeah. So. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. You didn't get one? <laughs> Thanks, Rita. Um, okay. Oh, I don't have the slides. I only have Next, we have a slew, a, a slew of policies <laughs> to look at and re and review. Um, so, the policy committee is Scott and Julie, right? No. Scott no. and Janine. Yes. Sorry, Janine. That's right. I know Julie really wanted to be on policy no. committee, and Janine <laughs> nosed her out for that last we'll seat. Begin with Jay. Pardon me. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So, John, I don't know if you want to lead this, or Scott, or Janine, or Bernard can lead it. Sure. Before I before I turn it over to Mr. Connolly, who this is uh, this is his wheelhouse, the student activity funds policy. So, I think based on the recent audit, and Michael certainly can speak to uh, more specifically about this. But Michael came to me, and ultimately we brought to the subcommittee uh, Mr. Buckley and Ms. Imbriano, um, so recommended changes yeah. that we want to codify. We're recommending to you that we codify in a policy. It is a lengthy one um, because it inco in incorporates. Um, a handbook, so to speak, or a set of regulations to go along with the policy. Um, I want to thank and commend Ms. Imbriano and Mr. Buckley for the time that they gave to working with Michael and I on this. It, there was a, it was having four sets of eyes looking at it was, I think, very helpful. So I think what we have to, in front of you tonight is a pretty, uh, pretty substantial um, draft uh, of our recommendation. And I think Michael's prepared to talk to you a little bit about it and maybe answer any questions that you yes. might have as well. Okay. So. so yeah, what, as Mr. Bernard just highlighted what really drove some of the change in the policy was um, in partly the student activity regulations were updated um, over the last few years and um, we are required to have an outside auditor, um, you know, certified CPA from audit of student activity uh, accounts um, at least once every three years. So that was something when the regulations changed, we kind of worked into our, our schedule. They, they were audited internally last year, um, and the town accountant um, sort of helped, helped perform that audit. So this was the year we chose to have the outside auditors come in. We had engaged the firm, Lance and Keith, to, to come in. Oh, thank you. And uh, perform the, the, the audit. And um, I, I do think the audit went, went well, um, given it was our first outside audit that we have had on the student activity accounts for a number of years. I'm gonna say oh, maybe almost a decade. So, um, you know, the, the effort is to kind of obviously be in compliance with the new regulations of having this done once every three years. So we're now gonna be on that every three year cycle. Um, and then the findings, there were five findings that were highlighted in the separate bound copy that I think really was the driver behind some of the procedural changes um, that were, that were um, we're recommending this evening and that would discuss at the policy subcommittee meeting. Um, the other thing that we also took care of in this round of, of recommended changes was a lot of kind of house dressing items 
um, we noticed there was a series of kind of grammatical type uh, uh, inconsistencies that needed to be addressed in terms of um, editorial changes and creating greater consistency throughout the document on capitalization and word phrases and so forth. So that was also addressed or attempted to be addressed um, throughout the, the meeting that we did have as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I can certainly take, you know, I'm prepared to take questions on some of the, the, the findings. I, I will say, you know, I, anytime you have a finding, it might seem like, oh, you know, what, there's a finding, I'm doing something, something, you know, wrong. And I think, um, you know, I've been through several student activity, uh, you know, CPA, outside audit, audit, audits of student activity funds in several other districts. And I will say, um, having only four or five findings, um, is, was actually pretty good. So they, they even though there are things we need to address and we're working to, to make sure that happens, um, I think it's fair to say Melanson and Heath and the auditors that came out um, did feel like, you know, things were in good shape and um, some of the things that we're addressing procedurally that um, there's a need to procedurally address them um, in, the, in the actual policy. Some of the things we're actually already doing, but they just weren't in the policy or in the handbook and they wanted to see that happen uh, more formally. And some of the things it's necessary to kind of take to the next level that we need to, you know, work on, and we're prepared to do that. Um, for example, uh, you know, there was need to add some language that student activity accounts need to be approved on an annual basis by the school committee. So you may recall we have not really been doing that. That's a, that's a regulation change that occurred over these last few years. We've been doing that as new um, accounts have been. Um, been requested, we had that presentation, and we and we, vo we vote to approve that new account. But they would the regulations state that kind of on an annual basis, the school committee should be kind of receive a report or a breakdown of the active accounts, and um, should actually take a vote of approval. So we reference that in the document, and we will be prepared to do that this this fall. Um, you know, there were other type of things to address some of the findings. Um, you know, some of the other things that they want to see happen is also periodic reports out to the school committee on, on either account balances or so forth. So that was something that, um, you know, we, we were kind of doing uh, maybe once annually. They want, they want to see that done maybe twice or, or, or quarterly, and they wanted us to actually include the account balances in that report. So there was, there was reference in some of the reporting reconciliation um, language in the procedure manual, mainly DK-R. That, that we have added. Um, you know, some of the other items um, I'll highlight was around st uh, student travel and, and uh, field trips. Um, they just wanted to see a greater level of consistency by actually formalizing a, an, an approval form of um, ensuring that all field trips were, uh, you know, approved by the school principal and those that require school committee approval um, that there's evidence of that as well, which we did, uh, which we did show, but they actually wanted to see a kind of a, an authorization form added, added to our, our procedures and our policy, which we've done. Um, so I think, uh, you know, there, there's also a need um, or request when field trips and major, you know, foreign travel trips are complete, that there's a, a you know, a statement of accountability is what they refer to it in the audit report or, you know, a field trip income and expense report is kind of turned in by that class advisor responsible and um, that's also documented and filed with the other receipts and expenses for that, for that trip. So these are things that will certainly require some additional training, which we'll do this fall to the club advisors and club treasurers involved with student activity accounts um, as well as the school secretaries and so forth. But we are, you know, certainly will be prepared to do that. And I think really what this, the changes are addressing are those four to five findings in the audit report. Um, you know, some of it's just creating um, you know, greater clarity on some of the forms we were using. Um, you know, one example of that is we certainly had a, you know, a, a turnover receipt form or a request for an expense form. And they wanted to clearly see, you know, the, the level of authority or those, those those folks, the principal and so forth, approving that that expense, and um, we actually we actually added lines for them to approve as opposed to them. They were just kind of initialing um, on that form, so we just kind of made things a little bit more clear based on their recommendations. And um, you know, I think it's fair to say that you know, with the the changes that we're recommending, will certainly address a, a lot of the findings and bring us into compliance with the new regulations. So that being said, I guess I'll turn it over. Any any, any questions, comments? The only only one comment I would have is, a, Mr. Bernard, it, it maybe 
I know it was helpful for me is just seeing the red line form sometimes mm -hmm. when, when, a, when okay. just to be able to compare the two documents. And there's a whole new policy, obviously not, but you know, on some of these, you know, just to, it, I think it would help the committee just to see the sure. uh, changes yeah. that we well, made. Sure, as opposed to attaching the old. Yeah, I mean, just to, to see the red, the red line. Yeah, well, that was my big question: yeah. is what are the, what are some of the changes? Yeah, I mean, I can I can walk you through some of them. Why are we calling it? Well, I don't I don't need you, to, but some of the major ones. And why are we calling it new instead of revised? Because it's not a new policy. We already had a policy. The new version. Yeah, I, I think it, I think it was just, was just it was just to try to. I so, yeah, that was just our. It'll new be a revised new. policy. Yeah, we okay. were just trying to draw a distinction between what was yeah. the existing policy DK. And then the final question that I had, are, even though you know I'm an advocate, and, and some of the things in this audit were some of my concerns, um, sure, yeah. and I'm glad to see those addressed. But are we are we overburdening people here at all with this policy? Are we putting too many things in place to make it too difficult to, um, to collect yeah, and report on student think, activity funds? It's good. We've had conversations with the administrative team and the principals, and um i don't think so i think i think we already have the the system and the structure in place and in some cases it's it's taking things to a little bit to the next the next step or the next level or, or formalizing some of the procedures but i think it certainly you know can be addressed and can be handled and um you know i think there's key things that we you know that based on the regulations we need to just make sure that we're documenting and that's um you know the authorization of, of approval of field trips um you know, I think I think the biggest <coughs> change procedurally that I think is going to be felt at the, the teacher or the or the, the club advisor level is just documenting. Um, you know, when there is uh, a receipt turnover, we were, we we weren't always getting that that class student roster. So they talk about this pre of receipts or having that student roster. I think it was happening. I, there's no question about it. It was it was happening at the classroom teacher or club advisor level, but that it necessarily always wasn't being forwarded to the principal for filing in the, you know, behind the, the receipt turnover with, with the receipt. You know, we were documenting that there was 24 students that paid $25 and here's the cash, but they actually wanted to see the actual student roster. Here are the, here are the folks. So I think it's a matter of just, you know, retraining and re um, getting the teachers in the habit of just copying that form and just sending that in. So it's, it might be a little bit extra work on their part, but I, you know, I think it's, I think we can get there. And yeah. what about, what about things like, um, if you see, you often see students out at the Stop and Shop or the Dunkin' Donuts, they're collecting money in a can, yeah, right, or, or a, a bucket. What, what, what are the, reg I, I know there was something in here, but I don't quite remember. What are the regulations gonna be around that and, and how, do, how are those reported and what? Yeah, I mean, I think there's just, that's again, just making sure that when there is gonna be approved fundraisers by authorized student clubs on, the, you know, on behalf of work, you know, doing a fundraiser on behalf of the school district if it's a student club, that, that that fundraiser form, which is completed and approved by the principal, and then it's actually sent down to our office, which we, we file, we keep a binder of those, is is there and documented. And, um, and that there's an understanding when that club is approved that if they're gonna be doing revenue generating fundraisers, that there is an understanding of what, what they're gonna be doing. And is that new, the form, or do we already have that? That form has been in place. Yeah. Because one of the things that I think would be good, and my colleagues may disagree, and you two may disagree, is if we have a forum or request, someone's got, the cheerleaders are gonna be out at Dunkin' Donuts, or the lacrosse team is gonna be selling, or the football team's gonna be selling cards door to door, it might be good at a school committee meeting just to let people know, because you know, you go, you're sitting in your house and you got some kids coming by and I mean, it wouldn't hurt to give advance notice that some of those things are gonna be happening, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I mean, there's some you know, challenges in trying to you know, look at all those and get the <coughs> word out and communicate. The timing but sometimes. Timing, the timing of it, sometimes they're. We don't meet, but. Well, I'm not talking like all, but when, when, the ki when, the, when they're going out, the maskers have kids out mm. collecting money. <coughs> they, they have no uniform. They have no identification. They have no name tag. There, there's, not, there's no proof. And I'm not saying we have kids out running around trying to collect money, but there's no identification or evidence of who they are. That, that's, yeah. to, to me, that's an issue. I might be the only one who feels yeah. that way, but. Well, for, I mean, well, Mr. Reps, on your three points, on the, the last one first, I mean, perhaps maybe even just having something where anybody that's doing a fundraiser just on, on a web page just has like, these are the ones that are going on right now. So somebody could just look or just a card that says like, oh yeah, I go to this website to prove who I, who I am or 
whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's possible, but yeah. on, on your other, on your first two points, <laughs> I think we were very careful about trying to make sure that we kept kept this as narrowly defined as we could. We just wanted to make sure that we were in compliance with the audit, and I, I think in general, it seems like everything was being done, and more than anything, we wanted to make sure that we're protecting everybody, because whenever you're looking at the use of funds, you want to make sure that it's not just because the auditor is telling us to do this. We want to make sure that students are doing it the right way, teachers are doing it the right way, and nobody makes an innocent error and in some way ends up looking suspicious. And so I think a lot of it was just clarifying what forms, yeah. the procedure, who approves it, who right. it goes through. And so I think a lot of the clarifications were, were really just clarifications Clarical. of yeah. what's going on. Yeah, yeah um, I, did, I did consider <coughs> printing the um, track changes version because we made so many little um, yeah. Grammatical and capitalization consistencies. It, it was. It did seem hard to to follow, mm -hmm. um, but I. You know. I think. In the end, we decided. I decided. Yeah. It was, no, it was. It was so cluttered that it was almost difficult to follow. But. It, yes. But I think the biggest changes and some of the ones I highlighted are, you know, the items that specifically spoke to those five audit findings. It was mainly that was language that was added. Um, you know, I can give you some examples, like on on page two and. Um, you know, Part B, there were statements that were added that would just re require the school committee to take a vote annually, as I said, as I said earlier, um, of an approval of each student activity fund. Um, you know, on page 10, under the, the language for reporting and reconciliations, you know, you're going to see language added to, um, to document the bank reconciliation process. And there was a need to take that reconciliation process that in a lot of ways we were already doing. We just weren't <coughs> formalizing that with a certified signed form by the people that were involved. So to those types of things um, that that you will find addressed. Yeah, and the, the only other point, your other point was about um, students collecting money with cans. We, we, we had a conversation about like where that money stored and not letting students take money home and making sure that yeah. they, that it's hand, turned over to the advisor so that it's not, yeah. money's not going home with students because yeah. we also want to protect the students as well. That are collecting money to make sure that they're not accused of doing anything. Yeah. So it was just tightening up a lot of things, and and some of the definitions were just if it's a defined term, making sure that you know if it's student funds, if it's student activity funds, and just clarifying that throughout. So it is rare, but we actually had that happen about ten years ago, I think it was, Mel, where some kid it. was going around. But, oh no, that the kid was collecting money yeah. for. Yeah. And yeah, that was about yeah. And it was about 14 was ten, years ago. 14 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. Remember that? <laughs> I think it was my first first or second year yeah. as principal. Yeah. yeah. I, know I was one of the victims. I don't know who the kid was. I was one of the victims. <laughs> and I and I gave cash. Yeah, he was going around collecting money saying he was from Maskers, Maskers I think. Maskers I think it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Julie? So how was so it found out? A4 and A5. Oh, does this pertain to school-based field trips or just like school club field trips. Um, when you say A4, A5. Like the last two, the, st uh, the field trips. Oh, you're trip. on the forms. Oh, the, the forms? forms. Like, oh, I see are those saying. forms that principals must submit <coughs> just for, you know, a I think if you find field trip to a farm or? Right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I, th I think yeah, if you I find think the reference to it, it explains what it's for in the, in the actual policy. So, so yes, A5 is certainly, they want, they did want to see that for all field class field trips okay. as well as the, the large. Not just trials. Correct. Clubs. Yep. Okay. Because I think these are two brand new forms. Correct. Right. These were, these were added based on their recommendation. Okay. These were actually forms they sent me. Okay. Um, after the audit and said these were their recommended, you know, they're similar to what they sent me. Okay. And page so this, eight. This would be, this would be a little bit of a change. Page eight explains why the forms were there and talks about the forms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They came from the recommendation. Yeah. In some cases, the authorization was there, but they right. were, were sort of there were actually a lot of emails from the teacher to the principal, and they their recommendation was to kind of formalize that by an actual authorized form. Um, so will this this whole approval process for financial reasons for the field trips and student travel will that eventually jump into our need or to approve need international trips. No, we're Did not. This a, kind of segue into that. We're approving, no? not endorsing international right. trips. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking: is that coming down the line? The policy or no? Yeah. I, I, I mean, the approval. I don't. I don't think the auditors didn't look. The auditors looked at the 
how the how the money is being handled. Right. Yeah. Right. Not about so approval not of right. yeah. what's authorized. What they did. That's right. Yeah. Like what they did is they actually selected a bunch of class field trips as well as student travel, overnight field trips, okay. um, foreign travel field trips, and they asked for the where the authorization was, and they they looked at a school committee policy that ones that re required some endorsement, and I um, provided that from the school committee notes, et cetera. But then there were ones, there were the smaller ones that were the class field trip ones that they actually wanted to see a principal. You know, but the foreign, so the foreign one where it costs like 4000 or whatever, they they won't be involved with that because that money is being paid separately to a private company? Correct. Yeah. Okay. But they still wanted to see in some cases that they were, there was a, the foreign you know, authorization that the trip was approved in some, right. in some fashion. And I, I also think, I mean, I think it's also worth noting, I mean, Mr. Connolly did a really good job of creating this in the first place because there was very little found. A lot of it was like, you don't have this in case there's, you know, ever a deficiency. You know, like a lang we had to put language in there, but right. I think That's there was like one small, like one field trip, they couldn't find one form that they needed or something. And so in general, it was a positive report for, especially for the first time you have a policy. Yeah, I think a lot of work over the last five years really has gone into the student activity process and mm -hmm. cleaning things up procedurally. And, um, you know, there are things that, you know, now that we have the report and that we'll address over the next year or two, so next time they come out, everything hopefully will be that much better. Any more comments, questions? At this point, I'll entertain a motion for approval of first reading of a revised policy DK student activity funds. We make a motion to approve the first reading of the student activity funds uh, fiscal management DK. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Next we have student discipline. And again, this is, uh, is this a revised policy that's taking a couple other policies and yes. combining them? <clears throat> it or? is, Mr. Chairman. So I could just give you a little introduction here. What this, what this strives to do, it was, it was uh, brought to my attention recently that we had some work to do to update our uh, policies on student discipline. Uh, particularly around changes that were enacted through um, through um, the legislature, so to conform with law, and I think what what we what I've attempted to do here with the help of of a, of a council <coughs> is to combine uh, two policies: one which was on the student behavior and one which was on disciplining students with special needs, into one uh, I would say fairly comprehensive policy uh, on student discipline with all of the associated procedures for. Um, hearings on, on matters that would warrant such under discipline of students um, and what provisions and cons correspondence principals must observe to conform with um, what we are required to do. So by labeling this, you know, again, it was just to, to draw a distinction between new and old, um, what the revised and original policies were, the JC and JC and JD at the back are the two that I mentioned, uh, student behavior and then student discipline with disciplining of students with special needs. The one on top, the new, the proposed new JC brings those two together and also updates them. But would it be JC slash JD or just JC? I mean, it would be. It would be my recommendation that there is no longer a JD. Okay. It is just solely JC. Any questions or comments? It, it looks right. like most of it's taken right from MGL Chapter right. Seventy One. That's so. correct. Yeah. And I think I think this was approved by council. It was, yeah. it was written by written council. Written by council, yes. so, yeah. yes. I mean, it, we didn't really make any changes to it because it was what council had approved or suggested. The only question I had was um, the right to an audio recording yes. from hearings. Mm -hmm. Is that presently done? No. It, we have had, I have had, situ I've had one situation that a parent was going to um, request that the hearing be recorded okay. back when I was a principal. So the fact that we are now saying we will do that, do we have the device? The means to do that, we do. Okay. We do. And staff knows how to use it. Go to the old fashioned tape recorder. Okay. Sometimes yeah. the, the appellant will bring the That's correct. Device, right. So, yep. so. Anything else? Actually the case I had, that's what it was. Mm. They requested it. Okay, I will entertain a motion uh, for approval of first reading revised policy JC, which is uh, student discipline combination of old policies JC and JD. We'll make a motion to accept the new revised, or just revised, however you want to say it, um, student discipline 
formerly JC and JD to be just JC. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The chair, do we need to repeal JD? I don't know, do we? If it's been Ours. combined. Mm -hmm. Well, JD I think we do. I would, I would recommend we do that. Yeah, why, why don't we do it just I'll to entertain a motion to repeal policy you, JD. Motion to repeal um, the student discipline JD as it has been absorbed into JC. They're revised. Second. For the discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's good to have one alert attorney yeah, on the board. Good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you back, Buckley. <laughs> Calling me old, making fun of me because I forgot my chair. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay. Next we have. Uh, I just remembered where it was. So <laughs> 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 policy G A A, which looks like we're doing -A -A. the same thing here. G A A A, which yeah. looks like we're doing the or policy GA, as we like to call yes, it. Yes. As in lady. Which is, <laughs> which is combining <laughs> policy GA and policy GAB. GAB. Yes, GAB. Yes, correct. Mr. Bernard. Yes, so again, on the advice of counsel, um, we received some input. We, we've been asking our attorneys to, to work with us to, you know, kind of the more involved policies like, like these, non-discrimination, harassment, student discipline, to, um, you know, provide us with updates that have, you know, put us in alignment, I guess, where we need to be. And so both of these policies, both GAAA and JCAD to follow them on the, um, um, regarding harassment, whether it's of employees or students, are on the advice of counsel. So these are really just, you know, strive to update and bring us into alignment where we need to be and also update our reporting procedures. And so we have the, f the first one, we have first both one. the policy and the regulations. Correct. GAA, GAAA, and GAA. So the first one is for employees. AR. The second one is for students. Right, and so the first one combines GAAA and GAAB. Correct. 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 Okay, any questions on GAAA or GAAAR? The, 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 only, the, only the only question that I had was to Mr. Bernard about um, the non-discrimination th statement. Th that, that, the, uh, that the classes were, set, were different between the two policies, but who, what the protected classes were, but they said that was at the, at the request of counsel. So. I think the new ones are more updated based on state and federal regulations. Is that correct? They or? are, and also what is or is not. Since there, are, there are some that are applicable to employees that aren't applicable oh, right. to students, students. And, and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. So the non-discrimination statement, which was recently revised by the committee, mm -hmm. will stay as is because it's, mo it's the most inclusive, but then the applicable classes that are protected for either students or employees come out through the regulations. I have a question. Can we, what's the word, resend the GAAB well, in the same motion that we accept? No, I think we have to make two, have to be make two motions. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, let's ask the only lawyer here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think it's got to be two motions. We don't want to resend and accept in the same motion, right? Everyone thinks they're a lawyer. Huh? <laughs> no, I think it should be two. Repeal, repeal, Jerry, I think was the word we were using. Repeal. Repeal, yeah. yeah. So if there's no further comments or questions, I'll look for a motion to approve for first reading policy GAAA, personnel, non-discrimination, discrimination, and harassment prohibited, which is combining old policies GAAA and GAAB. And also, I should say, it's a policy GAAA and the regulations GAAA-R for approval. I'll make a motion, but do I have to repeat everything you just no, said? No, you can just, no. So moved. Good. <laughs> so moved. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous? Thank you. So similarly. Right. To rescind. Mm. To All right. We need to repeal, uh, repeal motion to repeal GAAB. Repeal or rescind? Repeal. Repeal, I think, is what you're referring to. All right. i make a yes. motion to repeal GAAB and GAAB. No, no, just G. R because it's oh, yeah. absorbed into the new. GAAA. We have Gaga and Abba here. <laughs> <laughs> but one clarification: Is it going to still be? Because it still says J G A A A R on this. Are they going to be two sections still, or is it just going to be under G A A? Yes. No, it's always two sections. The regulations always are uh, okay, separated. So, so then we shouldn't. We don't. We're not repealing. But they were. G -A -A they were. No, G. Oh. She said G A A B A G A A B R. 
Oh, BR. Yeah. The second. Okay. Is that right? If there was, if there was if a wait, BR, then yeah. Wait, is there a DAA yes. BR? Yes, there is. There's a BR. Yes, there is. Oh. Yes, there is. Okay. okay. All right, good. So that's right. Is there a GAA? Yes. Rescind. Okay. There's no GAA R. It's repealing. You you would be adopting GAA. Yeah, we already we did. did. Yes, we did. right. So now <laughs> and, 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 and repealing G A A B and G A B B G A A B R. Dash R. Stu just did this. B A B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B B do we need to mention it in the motion? Yeah, we approve GAA the policy and GAA the and and are the regulations. Right. Should we give that to a GAB? No, I, do, I know. <laughs> I know that by heart. I do too. Yeah, Vicky by B O B O and Vicky by B O B O D. Curly's a dope. Curly's a dope. Okay, we get. We have. Julie, you have an idea what they're talking about? We have a motion. It's a good thing, Julie. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> uh, uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? All's in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. And next, John, we have JCD. Right? Okay. Yeah. So this is now uh, similar to the one you just uh, adopted for first reading. This is similar, but it's applicable for students and the general public, whereas the first one was for employees. That is non discrimination, discrimination and har harassment prohibited. So this JCAD replaces or, is, or would update the existing JCAD. And this regulations behind it. And the company regulations, right. correct. But there's no but there's, there's no, no need for no repeal required. Okay. Right. <clears throat> okay. Make a motion to accept the students non discrimination, discrimination and harassment prohibited first reading um, for policy J C A D and J C A D R. Second. Further discussion? I w I'd like Mel to go back and read all of these before. <laughs> <laughs> used like I used to. I used to like to read them, but not <laughs> this. Would, we'd be reading till about eleven o'clock tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. No further discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Policy Committee. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, John. Yeah, it's uh, tough work. <laughs> it was good though. It was. It was. It was good. Okay. When you like what you do, it's fine. <laughs> October 2nd <laughs> town meeting warrant articles uh, this is uh, we have the town meeting coming up coming up October 2nd at this time do we have any I, I don't believe we do mr. chairman um, but I thought I would put it on the agenda so that I didn't want to present I have to believe we're talking about October town meeting. I know <laughs> yeah, I know really yeah is there anything we want to ask for <laughs> <laughs> when do we have until we have until, we have until August, August 21st, 21st yeah. but that's our next meeting is the 28th I suppose if something came up, we could uh, you could have an emergency meeting, but I don't I don't think there's anything. I didn't anticipate that there was any, but I certainly didn't want to speak for the committee. So we don't have to do anything more on the naming of this room. No. That's all done. No, in fact, I can talk about yeah. that later, I guess. But yeah. um, I don't think we have anything. Unless we I mean, want to just ask for something to get them all ticked off. <laughs> right. Well, they may we may take a vote or make a recommendation on the um, ordinance that they talked about tonight. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might. But that won't be our. We would do that yeah. in the pre-meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The pre yeah. But they said they were going to come and yeah, they were going to come and present to us uh, oh, when they okay. when they have that ordinance. So okay. they have to go now. Hmm. Anything else? Okay. So we don't have anything to put on the town meeting warrant at this time. October town meeting. Next, we have minutes. I read through these. They look fine to me. It's the open session for June nineteenth, two thousand seventeen. So if I can have a motion to approve. Motion to approve the open session of June 19. Minutes. Second. For the discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, next we have the end of year budget report. Michael. Yes, great, thank you. So the uh, final 2017 budget update and financial report was included in the packet this evening. Um, I'm happy to report that the 2017, you know, closing out fiscal year 2017 went very well. Um, you know, we were able to identify some surplus funds, mainly in kind of salary accounts on, on the, the payroll side and on the expense side, some insurance and utility accounts, as you can see on the report, which all helped to assist with meeting our prepayment. Uh, objectives, special education prepayment, tuition prepayment objectives that we had forecasted during 
the fiscal 18 budget development process. Um, I just remind you that we were trying to get to $125,000. Uh, we were able to exceed that amount, and we actually have prepaid um, you know, closer to $250,000, which and this will all assist the district in helping us address some unforeseen costs that you know may arise in fiscal year 2018. And I'll just remind you, some of that already had kind of come up, some additional costs that um, kind of after the budget you know, development you know process. So I think that's important that we, we exceeded that amount, and I'm happy to report because we were kind of conservative and things went well towards the end of the year, the last quarter of the year, we were able to um, it, you know, see the amount we had forecasted. Um, the other piece of positive news that the food service program closed out the month of, of June, um, although it, they did have a net loss in the month of June, which is pretty typical, it was less than last year, a little over $5,000, um, which you know, that made the, the total uh, net loss for the year um, a total of $3,139.69. So um, again, significant strides have been made as we've talked about in the past by the food service program. A lot of hard work has gone in um, by the, the work of Chartwells and, and Anna McGovern, the food service director and the food service staff to, to improve the program. And, uh, and financially, the program is certainly on, on path to be a break-even program. And we came very close to doing that this year. Um, you know, last year we, we lost a little over $16,000, so this year we're a little bit over 3000 so it's good news that the program continues to be performing well. And as you know, we um, have removed all food service, you know, subsidies from the general fund in next year's budget, so it will certainly be a need to be break even next year, and I'm, I'm pretty confident we can do that. Um, on the payroll side, there's really nothing significant to report. Um, you know, as I've been reported in the past, as you can see, as you can see on the, the final report here, um, there are some available balances in the substitute account, you know, higher than, than we have had in the past. That's mainly because we just had a, less of a need to appoint long-term substitutes to fill some extended leave of absences, um, which kind of varies in, you know, each, each year. Um, but, you know, all really remaining, you know, payroll lines uh, were very close to, to, to budgeted amounts. Um, you know, there's a little bit of, of, of funds in the salary accounts as there as has been, you know, you know, in the past. So, you know, overall, you know, despite some unanticipated costs that we incurred this year, I, I think due to our conservative spending approach and, uh, that we had throughout the year, we were, were able to achieve our, our carryover funds that we had hoped for during the fiscal 2018 budget process. and. I think as we begin to in, enter the fiscal, or we're actually as we're in the 2018, um, I think we're in pretty you know solid financial standing. But we'll and we'll have to see how everything hiring season shakes out and so forth. But I think we're in pretty good shape. Any questions? On that, next you have the report, the annual report on. Oh, Julie. Yeah. So my son came to summer camp here, and it's the first time that this basketball camp has been here. Okay. And they didn't have lunches, and in previous places they've had lunches. Okay. Is that something that food service would even entertain in doing, to, you know, provide lunches? Like, how would, do um, they do that sort of thing? They could, yeah, they do do that sort of thing. They have done it. They have done it for certain events, major events at the school. I don't think, I don't think they've gotten into... Um, like I just don't know camps. if it's financially feasible for them to offer that sort of thing. I'd, I'd like them to be at least asked. Yeah. Like how many kids are there at the camp? Hundred. I think it would be worth their while. I think it would be. I mean, I think it would be worth exploring. With yeah. It could be more than yeah. that. Like, I don't, like my kids went to Summerscape today and they had to like, pack lunches. Yeah, I mean, there's some challenges given it's the summer weeks that tend to shut down and things get kind of right. put away. I mean, I just didn't know if they even eat. offered that. The other yeah, I think they so how many kids offer. bring their lunch with them, so would I think it have to be like a box lunch sort of thing. They, 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 could, do a, they could do a box lunch, yeah. brown yeah. bag. Box I mean, lunch. I'm just thinking, like, as teenagers, they'd rather come and buy right, some yeah. pizza and a salad, and I know... I think it would be at least worth... I think it's definitely worth exploring. And I don't know, perhaps... He did contact food services, and maybe it wasn't feasible. I don't know. Yeah, I would doubt sure, it. I don't, yeah, I don't think, think so. Would we used to have a camp? It would probably be oh, difficult really? to do it at all of the schools. Oh, wow. So you send him to camp be, every yeah. day without lunch? No, I send him to lunch, <laughs> but oh. he would have preferred having, you know, something here. And I think parents would have preferred. Just yeah, I think it should be. It can be explored. I think like to. It's really interesting because when 
a long time ago, my son went to the camp at Merrimack, and all they talked, all he talked about was no, the that, lunch, yeah. not, the, never, not the camp, not the camp, right? The, the Merrimack lunch, sure. but but I do. that's a lot of kids. I think it's definitely worth yeah. contacting them. I think if you know, we can reach out in the future and see if. And I um, think at least involved. if camps, you know, it would be great if more camps looked to rent the space in yeah. in the coming years, mm -hmm. if they at least knew that that was an option. Yeah, sure. I think that may attract more people as well. Sure. No, that's a good question. Absolutely. I wouldn't say. Yeah. I would say ask. Yeah. I would. I would encourage them to. Absolutely. To, to look into it. Okay. I mean, I there are some scheduling logistics and things like that sure. we have to be considerate yeah. of to make sure that the school gets clean. But I think you know that camp came in early. You saw the first first uh, coat of finish on the gym floor was done today. Right. So I mean, we we you know things can be adjusted. It's not that we couldn't we wouldn't be able to rent the entire span, but. I think and I, mean, I think one, it was is it, it's worth at least looking at. That at least I heard and my son heard was the temperature. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they did not have no, uh, yeah, at Merrimack. Gyms yeah. At Merrimack. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the gym that cools was, nicely. It does. You know, they really enjoyed the space. Great, it's nice to See, hear. I don't like that for summer camp. I want them to be in the summer. <laughs> yeah. I really do. I mean, you know, that's. No, that's old that's good. That's good to so know. That's the objective. I mean, that we, we the, the catering is what's going to put us over the, the top. You know, if, you know. right. We, like we, just we, those couple, you know, weeks right. of camp could right. have right. solved could have closed that, that gap. That deficit, yeah. You know, you know? We, we I think we've talked to you about the catering that started. We had two bank two athletic banquets here this spring. Um, you know, I'm hoping that catches on a little bit more into next year. Um, but yeah, I I I, I think. Absolutely. I don't want to speak for you, but I think we, we, we're certainly looking to entertain any and all options. I'd like to see them start catering school committee meetings if they could. Absolutely. <laughs> they did it that one time. No food in this room. No, no food, no food in this room, room, though. That's right. <laughs> you have to have it outside. Okay, Michael. The gifts and donations report, which is uh, yeah, eye-opening. Yeah, another, another again, uh, positive report. And, um, you know, included in the packet this evening was a memorandum that details the total amount of in, both in-kind monetary and monetary um, gifts that the school department has received from a variety of our, our support and parent groups as well as private donors and, and so forth and it's a re remarkable three-page list of donations that kind of goes on and on and incredibly the total amount for fiscal year 2017 is four hundred twenty thousand four hundred seventy nine dollars <laughs> and seventy nine cents so it's just a significant amount um, of, of funds that we received and accepted this year. Um, again, these, these impressive list of donations help fund expenses like athletic team expenses, fitness equipment, transportation expenses for class field trips, technology equipment, um, expenses to help support drama and musical productions, um, expenses that help support enrichment activities, and of course, the, there was you know two pretty significant big projects going um, occurring that there was some a significant amount of fundraising efforts, and that was the sod and irrigation, and irrigation field project down at the middle school and high school athletic fields, which collected a total of one hundred eighteen thousand six hundred and fifty dollars in donations, and then of course the little school playground project, um, which collected a total of one thousand. One hundred thousand two hundred eighty-one dollars and fourteen cents, um, which is so. Those two were significant kind of projects that were going on. That's not maybe wouldn't be going on every year, but if you subtract the two from the those two large items from the total, we're still at two hundred uh, two hundred one thousand five hundred and forty-eight dollars and sixty-five cents. So but well over two hundred thousand. Every year, there's going to be another big project or two big projects, sure. and. Hopefully the community continues to be as generous as it Absolutely. possibly can. Can we go through each one of these and thank them? No, I. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. That, that would after I read all the policies, okay. we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, the list does include some that are that are on there for tonight. You know, so it does make the assumption that the ones that are in a moment, that I think uh, we'll be looking for the final acceptance on that was received before <clears throat> prior to June 30th. You know, it's interesting. Um, uh, I had more than one person come up to me and ask me about the outfield fence on the high school baseball field and how did we get the money to pay for right, that? Where here. did the money come from? Right. It's right here. Every single dollar is spelled out right here. Yep. And I told them it was all by all by donation. private donation, but yep. they wanted to know why we would spend whatever we spent to, to put yeah, that fence no, out. No, there. no money no. from the budget. I did have one question. There's a donation here, and I don't know. I've been out back there. Has that fence been put up yet in the back by the tennis no, courts? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I, remember, I, mean, I don't believe it has. Yeah, good question. I haven't seen mm. it. Um, okay. Um, but this is uh, 
again, a generosity yeah, community. And, and, and in light of the fact that we don't have an active education foundation, these these donations fill the gap. If we did have an education foundation, Absolutely. these donations might be going. A lot of them to that education fund, which you know, six one half dozen the other, yeah. is still supporting the schools. Yeah. So, but this is this is great. And as Michael said, uh, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't have the um, playground at the little school. Right. We wouldn't have the sod and the irrigation system up here um, in, at the fields without these generous donations. So, and again, like these are things that you know should be funded through the town. Many of them should be and funded. Devices, exactly. Programs, right. Um, supplies for teachers. Well, between this and fees, it's and it's this is what's happened. We've gotten away right. from funding things that should be part of the budget, and now it's just kind of almost an unwritten law that these won't be in the budget anymore. And so now we look for a million, million and a half, two million dollars every year in fees and other areas to it says a lot pay for these you're things. Getting two million dollars in fees and donations. Right. And you're still lacking in what it, you're offering. Fees, donations, and that tuition. Says a lot. And you count the the. Uh, the kindergarten, right? right. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot. This is great. Any other comments or questions? Thank, thank you. Thanks, thank Michael. Michael. Okay, next we have uh, John's uh, new staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in your packet, I have a, an update on um, new staff that have been hired, and I would just want to emphasize that um, with maybe one exception, these are all to fill um, retirements or resignation. These are not additional staff um, necessarily. Um, at the Batchelder School, I'm, I'm happy to welcome Janine Abrams as a special education teacher, Heather Cuoco, a first grade classroom teacher, Caroline Beaumier, a uh, general paraprofessional in our kindergarten program, and Sarah Pitt Fitzpatrick as a special education uh, paraprofessional. At the Hood School, Mara LaCava as an occupational therapist, and Sophia Mormotis, a special education reading specialist. At the Little School, Kristen Filippo, who will be a half-day kindergarten teacher, and Alessandra Solani, a special education paraprofessional. At the Middle School, uh, Rebecca Scobie will be a new psycho school psychologist. At the high school, Matthew Costello is a health physical education teacher, and Jonathan Hudson will be a special education teacher who is a board certified uh, behavior analyst as well. And at the middle high school, we have um, two custodians replacing uh, two gentlemen who have resigned, uh, Evan D'Amato and James Fafard. There will be another report that I'll make to you in August as we do have some other vacancies that have not yet uh, been filled. So See, at welcome least to all those folks to North Reading. I recognize at least one uh, North Reading High School grad in there, Sarah maybe two. Sarah Fitzpatrick. about the Solani? Uh, Alessandra Solani, yeah, right. So two. John, can you tell us which position was a new position? In the league so we had the uh, kindergarten position at the Batchelder, and that's it as new positions, so correct? Yeah. yeah, everything else is a resignation or a retirement. While we're on these positions, we were, there was a little bit of concern about, was it the Hood School kindergarten enrollment? And if we got a few more students, we might have yeah, a so at, at the, did you say at the Hood School? Yeah. Yeah, so this, actually this morning, uh, Michael and I met with the three elementary school principals to kind of conduct an, a, a kind of a midsummer assessment on where we are with kindergarten. The numbers are very tight. Um, we were up, tw uh, I think we're up 20.5 students from where yeah. we were this year and we kind of anticipated that which was the additional position but the numbers you know again that's in a that's if you look at it in just a, a one big picture but where you start when you start to break it up among the three schools and where with what the populations are at each school we're, we're very tight at the, at the hood school um, but we have we do have a little bit of flexibility right now but you know I'm, I'm I would say mildly concerned that if we get a an influx in August that you know, tips the scale a little bit. We might have to be making that's some difficult like decisions. Full day and half day? Combined, right, because that's where the hybrid's going right. to be. Right. So, you know, we have a little bit of flexibility, but it's not a lot. So where are the classrooms right now? Like, what are the sizes? Uh, pop, pop, let me think. It is 22 twice? Yeah, 22. 10, is it 10 or 11 in the half day? Either it's 10 in the half day. 10 in the half day. So they're kind of like right on that cusp. And of the 22. Correct. Correct. Right. Yeah. Right. In one of the classes. Everybody's offered full day if they want. So it's close. Correct. 
but we do have some families that have opted for the kind of the open enrollment, I'll say, to go to what they wanted the full day but knew that the spot mm -hmm. would not be necessarily in their district school and have taken advantage of that because they want the full day spot. So right now, every family, as we've you know tried very hard to maintain for the last couple of years, any family that wants the full day has it. It may not necessarily be in there. That means they have to provide school. their own transportation then. Correct, right, right. You're, you're saying so somebody in the little or the batch could go to Hood. Correct. Or, or whatever the situation might right. be. Right now, the vacancies are at uh, the full day or at the batch. The batch. Yeah. Where we added the third section. And, and that's, that's as recent as today, actually. Yeah. And those 22 that are in the two hybrid, mm -hmm. that's with a para. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. we're, you know, right now we're holding, you know, and, and I, you know, it's kind of a hard, it's a moving target. You know, I've kind of asked the principals, I asked them again today, like historically, what do you see in August? And it's not, you know, it's hard to predict, but I think you know, we, we can say, you know, we're kind of all right now hoping that we're able to continue to accommodate as we, as, as we are right now, but it's, it's, it's close. 22 is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> okay, next we have. Uh, but it's, I think we're, you know, I think people want the, 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 the program, you know, and I think They'll, they'll say, you know, okay, and the teachers, you know, the teachers are good. Principals conveyed that to us today, yeah, yeah. that they know the teachers will make it. And the para helps, you know, and, and in some cases the, with the hybrid students leaving midday. You know, so essentially was proved to be someone, a good experience. if someone moves into Hood, I mean, are they told you need to go to another school? If they want full day, yes. That w that's what's happened. Okay. Yeah, we have that happening now. And, and they're doing it. And then you have other people that have opted and said, yeah, I'll do it if I have to do it type of thing. So Yeah, what if they want a half yeah, day? Yeah, if they're a half day, then. If a half day, that's problematic. Yeah, that's problematic. But they can't force them to move to another. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. So we're close right now. That's why I say to you, there's very little flexibility. But we have options that, you know, we would explore if we, if we need to. And you said the, these numbers are close to what we'd expected this year? An increase? I'd say so. Or yeah. 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 Which was why the, the, the full day kindergarten addition was, we saw that as being critical. It's 20.5, 20, 20. Yeah. am I right? Correct. From yeah. where it was last year exactly. to this year. 20.5 students, yeah. Okay. Overall enrollment in kindergarten. Anything, so. el anything else on the new staff? John, when's the, um, when's the luncheon for the new staff? I, I'm gonna do that in my report. Okay. And I, I, I provided with the sheet. Okay, all right, next we have, these are, these are the final donations that came in for last fiscal year. Um, so we have a lot of them. I don't know who wants to read them. Yeah, we have a number tonight. This is Julie's turn. I'll do it. You do right. it now, second. Okay. Um, I'd like to make I a motion like that the Michael. school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation in the amount of $50 from Kathleen Apigian Pigeon, for the yes. LD, Bachelor Scholar, LD Bachelor Scholarship Fund. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. <coughs> to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of a first act drum set for the Bachelder Elementary Music Department. But one clarification, should we put the value in there too? Oh, the value is $150. Oh, and it's from Douglas and Mary Carey. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation in the amount of $1,225.50 from the Little Elementary School Parents Association to benefit the Drama Club. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations the above list of school activities and expenses from March 2017 through June 30th, 2017 from the High School Parents Association totaling $1,425. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation in the amount of $3,000 from the North Reading Touchdown Club to purchase a porta phone headset for the high school football team. Second. For a second, I thought I said porta potty when I, I first I when I read it at home, I and I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I did. I really. Wanted. I was like, "We're making the football team pay for the porta potties now." <laughs> I almost I would have read it that way. Yeah. What were you doing with the word headset? I don't know. <laughs> it was really weird. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. 
like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation in the amount of seven thousand dollars from the North Reading Middle Schools pa Middle School Parents Association to be used at the discretion of the principal. Second. Interesting. Well, he's not going to like a or anything. No, this is uh, middle. This is the oh, middle, middle school. school. Oh, sorry, aren't Kathy. Kathy. <laughs> Jeez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations, specifically teacher supply reimbursements, $590, enrichment activities, $7,428, class field trip expenses, $1,600, general school supplies, $530, other school activities, $705, dollars totaling ten thousand eight hundred fifty three dollars from the bachelor school parent organization second all in favor i like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations specifically enrichment activities totaling two thousand five hundred fifty dollars class field trips three thousand eight hundred eighty dollars technology and equipment four thousand five hundred dollars other school activities, $455, totaling from March to June 30th, $11,385 from the Middle School Parents Association. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. <coughs> I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude <coughs> in-kind donations, specifically teacher stipends, $5,531.54, enrichment activities, $2,846.50, technology and equipment, $920.66, other miscellaneous items, $1,350.86, teacher appreciation activities, totaling $1,379.69 for a grand total of $12,029.25 from the Hood School Parents Association. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude mm -hmm. in-kind donations, specifically teacher supply reimbursements, $1,000, enrichment activities, $8,495, Class field trips, $2,550.85. Other school activities, $2,943.54. Total from March to June 30th, $14,885.34. From the Little School Parents Association. Second. Second. <laughs> I wanted to do that. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, that's bad. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad. That's <laughs> we'll give that one to Scott. No, no, no. no. I, I Jerry clearly, beat me. Jerry beat me. I clearly beat him. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I thought you he was just said that you didn't even know they were a <laughs> no. We didn't say neither. <laughs> All those in favor? Oh, Aye. 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 I'm worried. It's incredible. I, I'm always shocked at how much money the uh, Parents Association. Well, I, a stupid question, but I know how do they raise? But yeah, uh, that's what I was going to ask. How do they raise all the money? How you do they raise the money. I mean, I know it's different auctions. Really? Yeah. Auctions. So they're running a lot of events. I write checks. Reese. Do you? I write checks. <laughs> cookies. Selling things. Oh, yeah. There's not a lot of. Would you say? At least the hood doesn't. I write a lot checks of a lot. Individual yeah. sales. Of, I'm on the you know, they don't anymore. They used to do. They used to do the gift wrap. They used to do. That's amazing. Nuts. They used to do the. So they raise a lot from the auctions. Oh, they do other events with yeah. trivia nights. Trivia nights. Trivia nights. Yeah. It's a tremendous amount of money. All right. So thank you, community. That wraps up our uh, donations from fiscal 2018, uh, 17. Sorry. <laughs> and now we're on to fiscal 2018. Bigger, better, and even more generosity. Or we'll see if that's possible. <coughs> Correct. Okay. Next, subcommittee updates. I don't believe there are any. Are there? Do we have a subcommittee meeting? Uh, we there did. Are. We had, yeah, we had oh, we did. Athletics. Uh, oh, I, I was looking forward to the NORCAM report. I, from can't, remember I, what we, I can't remember what we, we did we even, at the committee. You can't remember if we had a meeting. I <laughs> it was on June 20th. Yeah. I think uh, we talked about an NDE a budget we did. summary from it Michael. Seventeen thousand. Yeah, is that right? Oh, yeah, we're in pretty good shape. Yeah. I forgot my notes. We got seventeen thousand rollover. Uh, we talked about where we were with yeah. the new equipment for the fields. We've we've bought soccer goals. They've arrived. We've gotten the gates. We're in electricity. We've since gotten yep. an estimate on the um, dugout 
Closures? Oh, we have. Closures. Yeah. Less yeah. than what it was, or is it still around uh, 13,000? Yeah, about total, I think it was right around it was, there, right? It's a little under 5,000 a dugout. A little yeah. under 5,000. Yes. Per a dugout. Per a dugout. Well, we got to think about what we're going to do with that. Though. We've got some scoreboard um, quotes. We've got estimates, but no, no, no luck with the no bank. Move. No commitment no. to. No. Um, the, as John said, the gates came in at the dugouts. I mean, we had the electrical installed. <coughs> electrical yeah, installed before the scoreboard. The scoreboard. Right. In anticipation of it, that's that's completed. The um, dugout enclosures were kind of pricey. The first price we got, and it was almost it was almost yeah. seven thousand. But yeah, yeah. seven thousand each. Now each. Right. Five, I still think it's something we should uh, seriously look at. Not not. I mean, we'd have to raise funds yeah. to cover it, but we may have to raise, we have raise a funds. With softball coming up. Oh yeah, the next they meeting. Softball is coming to the next. We can talk to them about some of this. Yeah, that meeting is <coughs> August eighth. Yeah. Um, I think those are the. Well, back then I think you updated us on the. Uh, on oh the yeah, bathroom the bathrooms. Software. We also had the gentleman in from softball. Right, and we had a representative from youth softball there. Yeah, he was talking, good. and he's going to come back in uh, at next meeting to talk right. about some projects that we might be able to work on together, including possibly some things at the. At the little school. The little, the little school. At, yeah. But at the high school also. Yeah. yeah. At the new field, you know, we also discussed um, lights. I know we have we have some lights. Marty has a couple banks of lights that were. I think Marty was going to look into. Um, these were lights that these we. These are the old lights from the old practice no, field, weren't they? No, these are new lights. When we bought the lights for the turf field, yeah. we also were. There was some kind of deal or something where we got an additional two sets of lights, mm -hmm. like the ones on the current turf field. No, I don't. It, Marty was planning on putting <laughs> them on the old poles, but then we started talking at the last uh, uh, athletic sub meeting about. Could we possibly light the softball, softball field? Yeah. But you're going to need poles for that. Right. So Marty was supposed to look into yeah. potential costs on that, Marty Tilton. Um, I think that was about it. Yeah. We talked about the numbers. Uh, we had good numbers all year in terms of participation. participation. Yeah. Very We've got some really big numbers, I know, for soccer and football for the fall because we've already had uh, team meetings. So um, I think that's about it. Fall sports will be getting underway in what, August 15th? Do I write that? Yeah. Yeah. When does Julia yeah. Freighter for one dollar check? <laughs> you can go on to We want cash from you. <laughs> <laughs> Football, so that's. Getting a bus. A little earlier than that. Um, let's see, what else do we have? We had the uh, NORCAM. Scott, anything to report from NORCAM? Well, I mean, there was a little bit of crying when they realized that Mr. Venezia wasn't coming anymore. Yeah, I was, I was <laughs> after Jerry. No, you. Yeah. Go ahead, Sorry. Jerry was. Um, I mean, the only, the only, I mean, the, there was just kind of wrapping up the year. There aren't any meetings till September, actually, for them. But um, oh. I mean, the two things, the two things they did talk about were number one that they're going to try to purchase some new computers so they can do a little bit more, and they're still looking. Apparently, they've been looking for new locations, and the only concern about that is it's where it is right now is really convenient to the high school and middle school if if students want to get over there. Yeah, and so, but. They're running out of space there. Yeah. So if they move, they may move to a location where it's not going to be quite as easy for high school, middle school. It's the only thing I thought was relevant to the school committee. Move, move for them is big too because they get some big switches and equipment that has to be moved when they yeah. when they move, and coordinate it all with Comcast and yeah, well, Xfinity. I mean, in possibly if there's Verizon. places on there. Either. Yeah. Well, yeah. But Comcast has a building down in Park. Not that's anymore. I don't. I think they sold it, didn't they? they? Oh, they were. I think that was one place they actually looked. At. There's a building that's open. There's a building that it wouldn't um, be as much wiring for the contract. Right. Room, so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. Policy sub. We basically went over. Right. The only, the only next other, meeting. The only other thing was like this week on Thursday we're meeting to, to look at the MASC recommendations. Right. And probably gonna. We have to go through. They had like what 99 policies and we, that they suggested. We're kind of anticipating me this being the first in a series of meetings right. to do that, right? right. Yeah. And then after we get through those, we can do the ones that they've just already kicked out. Right, right. There were two sections, right. kind of two, yeah. two yeah. objectives there, right. And that was from their mailing of yes, yeah. Yeah, the bulletin of yeah. things. Yeah. Right, right. And I, this isn't a subcommittee report. I just wanted to add that I, I did attend um, the <coughs> final meeting of the Suburban Coalition. Uh, it was held in Linfield, and uh, they have decided to disband, and I was one of the votes in favor. Uh, the people running, Dorothy um, Presser. Presser. Presser from Linfield, has been running the organization for many years, really doesn't have the time anymore. They've been trying to find other people to come in and take over, and they, they just can't find the people. So uh, we, we talked a little bit about maybe putting on hiatus, and they said they've been looking for so long, they don't see what another three months is going to do. 
what I said was maybe if the thing is dissolved, maybe mm -hmm. someone will step up and say, hey, we ne really need this organization, because it was valuable. They kept our, you know, they worked really with MASC and kept our focus on some of the main issues, um, including the, um, you know, the, the budget, budget. Uh, resolution committee, foundation budget resolution committee. So um, that Suburban Coalition is no longer. And they had something like $11,000 left, and they did, uh, the vote was to donate it to, why can't, is it Mass Budget? It's a, a Mass Budget Foundation or Mass Budgets. It's a group that uh, has donated a lot of time to Suburban Coalition, helping them to understand the budgets and taxes, et cetera. And it's a, it's a, um, a nonprofit, so they could donate the money to another 501 uh, 3C. So it was too bad, but um, I know Cliff, we were a member. We were one of the, um, we're in a lot of school committees that were members, and um, Dorothy uh, stressed at the meeting to the people who were there that North Reading was one of the more active. Cliff was pretty involved. Right. He, he really was, yeah. yeah. And well, as a committee, <laughs> but as a committee a that, of us today for me. <laughs> but that we were a lot, we were very involved in a lot of the issues, actively involved in a lot of statewide issues, and that many other committees don't make that time to get involved. So it was, as I say, it's too bad. Uh, it was a good group. It's been around since the early 80s. Wow. So um, it's like 30. That, the combination of that and then when Enro disbanded here in North Reading as right. well. And there was talk about that. Wasn't there a charity that they were trying to get going again that you had mentioned? The foundation? Uh, the, the, the foundation. foundation. I mean, is there any update on that? <coughs> John, have they any talk about the educational foundation? Not since the last update I gave you. It's um, never been able to get it off the ground. Yeah, no. I, I mean, was one person that was Eric Eric Evans yeah, yeah, Eric. expressed interest. I held a meeting here. John Murphy, you know, they were willing. You know, the, the paperwork needed to be refiled, but um, I've heard nothing. No, it's a lot of time and it's a big effort, and you got to try to, you know, you got to put the time in in order to have the events to raise the funds, or it's it's not a worthwhile. Effort. Like, like you mentioned, you know, we're looking at you know four hundred and twenty thousand dollars of donations. You know, if, if we had a educational foundation, we wouldn't be getting no. those contributions. Right. So They'd I'm be going to the foundation. Going somewhere else. Right. right. Schools would still benefit, but in a different right. way. Right. Yeah. Way. Yeah. And I don't know if people feel more connection, perhaps, to their own kids' elementary right. school. Right. And going directly. More willing right. to donate because of that. They also have the latitude to identify a project that's important to them as a group, you know, for that, like you said, for that school and work toward that. Right. So. Like the little school. Exactly. Like right. Right. And, and I did mention um, earlier at our goal meeting, um, John and I are just going to have an informal sit down with uh, Brad Jones next week August to. Second. Yeah, yeah. To discuss. Any pos not that there's a lot of funds coming from the state and, and you know the tax revenues are not what they had hoped. They're a little bit lower, but just to sit down and talk with Brad uh, about what potential there is in the future for additional funds Help. for projects. Yeah. And can you discuss the, like the bills or the proposed legislation for the foundation? Review oh, yeah. Yes. The earmarks. FRBC, yep. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Okay. John, administrative report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I've provided you with a copy, a um, few things to talk with you about tonight. But I've provided for you, you probably saw in the transcript, there was a nice article about the um, high school's advanced placement scores. Um, I've, I've attached a copy for you there. I just I want to, again, state my appreciation for the staff um, who work with our, um, you know, growing advanced placement program and also for our students who I think do, a, you know, very good job of really stretching themselves and, and you know, we're, we, we're well, well into the 400s for exams administered. I think when I started as the high school principal in 19, uh, excuse me, in 2003, we had 87 exams administered. So we're in the, you know, approaching five times that now. And I think it says a lot about our, um, our students at the high school who seek to stretch themselves and really, you know, enroll in those most rigorous courses and our teachers who, um, teachers and administration who support them to try and to do their best work. So um, I just, I want to publicly acknowledge that. I, I provided you with a list of dates for um, the coming school year. Um, I think they're pretty standard. I do want to talk about one of them in particular, but the freshman orientation will take place here at the high school on August 22nd. The, um, the new educator orientation program, which school committee members are, are always invited to attend on the first day for lunch. That's around noontime here in the high school cafeteria. Do they still on the go on the bus ride? They do, do still do the bus ride. <laughs> yeah, absolutely mandatory. Condition of employment. 
<laughs> uh, so that'll be August 29th and 30th. Lunch will be here. Please come if your schedule allows um, um, to meet the, the new staff. Um, the middle school, its orientation program, the, the, the traditional walkabout day for grades 6, 7, and 8 will be on August 31st. On September 5th, the opening day for faculty and staff. Um, so I'm, I've changed, I'm going to be changing this day up substantially. Um, we're not going to be starting here um, with the all staff meeting in the morning. We're going to be instead coming here at around 11.15, um, 11.30, somewhere. I'll have a, a definite schedule for you, but we're going to be, I have, a, I have a keynote speaker coming in, and I just think, I felt like we needed a little bit of change to the opening day and just trying to do things a little bit differently. Yeah, long. yeah. So I think, you know, this, the staff doesn't know this yet. Um, I actually worked on my letter um, this morning. It's going to go out. I think I have it right now as a date of August 4th, but um, I think last year was August 11th. I'm going to try to get it a little bit earlier because it is a change. The parameters of the day will be the same, but I think the, the activities of the of the day will be different. Um, they, they definitely will be different. Should so go to, to my job's opening day? Uh, <laughs> you would be. Yeah, so I, I'm thinking that our, again, it's rough right now, but I think the schedule will be such that staff will go to their schools first, do all of their staff meetings. I think teachers really like getting into their classrooms, and I think you know this will give them an opportunity to do that first, and then we'll come back here for lunch. Everybody will come to the middle high school for lunch, and we'll do the district meetings, which I'm looking to cut back on that actually a little bit to allow for, I think, you know, what, what looks to be a very... Um, highly recommended and exciting. I'm excited about the person that I have coming in for. Uh, is this in lieu of anybody else speaking? Or well, you might remember the last few years we've had the student presentation, the performances, yeah. so it would be in lieu of that. I got you. Yeah. Okay. I thought, I was, I thought since I became chairman, it was in lieu of me speaking. I You're was, love the I was theme. taking it's called the Science of Happiness. Oh, I'm perfect for that. Science of yeah, Happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm Mr. Happy, <laughs> so I am perfect for that. <laughs> <laughs> So if you could just, you know, I think the committee has a good attendance record. <laughs> I know point this, to and, and this is what you look like if you're unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't blow it with your speech now, no. <laughs> so time just TBD. On I, I think it's it's roughly, um, you know, lunch is going to be like an 11, 11 15, 12 o'clock, 11, 30, 12, 15, at which time we'll then all go into the auditorium. So it's probably going to be in that noon. Be here about noon. Noon to two. Yeah, and I'll make sure you have the definite exact yeah. time, but I think that's, I'm within 15 minutes right now of telling you, but I think if you're here at noon, that will be plenty of time. Well, yeah. Certainly come for lunch if you want to. But I'll, I'll make sure you have well in advance um, the exact time. But it will not be 8.30 like it's traditionally been. And then our, our schools will open for students on uh, uh, September 6th with the um, grades 1 through 12 and the pre-kindergarten and kindergarten orientations <laughs> to take place on September 6th and 7th. And then, and then the um, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten students will start on September 8th. Amy Luckowitz mentioned um, a, a, as part of her presentation earlier this evening about screen agers. This this looks really good. This is this is a movie that we're going to the community impact team is sponsoring. Um, so I've, I've set the day. This is under the K to 12 action team of which I chair that small subcommittee with Rita Mullen, Amy uh, used to be Claudia Brown, but she's now retired. Kathy O'Connell, Peter Marjane, Lynn Clemens. We have a good group, and, and I think. Um, uh, Scott, you are on it. Amber uh, O'Driscoll is on it, uh, right? I think we have a good. We, we're an active group. We usually run about three presentations a year, I think, on average. We do the uh, North Reading Night Off. We usually have a guest speaker. We had Ruth Pody last year, so this is good. This, this looks really good. This is a, a, a film, a documentary about. Um, I'll, I'll say kind of the uh, to raise raising awareness around screen time of, of young people and how much time they're spending on phones, computers, devices, whatever. I think she cites an average of about six and a half hours a day, if you can right. believe it. Six and a half hours a day. So if you haven't seen the trailer, I gave you the flyer. It's, it's, it's worth looking at the trailer. It's very interesting. So um, the film came recommended to me. I checked it out a little bit. The, the um, community impact team is paying for um, the lease of the, of the film. So we get to show it and um, the supplementary materials and it will be free to the community. And I started a Sign Up Genius enrollment, I don't know, last week or so. This is October 11th, by the way. And honestly, within two or three days, it was over 100 people have already signed up. So it, you know, I'll continue to promote it, but it was an early, early high level of interest. Six and a half hours a day, and we need to adjust the school start time by a half an hour. Right, 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 yeah. Imagine six and a half hours, I was Bring I was them down shocked. to six hours and we can start. You are so time. wrong on the start times, mister. <laughs> And that's yeah. A little update for you on the capital improvements pro uh, projects that are undergoing. Thank I, you. Thanks for breaking projects. up that meeting. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How, how, how was that? Pretty slick. Um, so the elementary Wi-Fi project, which was 
funded in part between both the grant that um, the district received, the work of Michael Connolly, Patrick Daly, and Dan Downs, um, and a lot of cooperation of our elementary school principals, really. It was, a, it was a kind of a collaborative effort, but that project is complete, um, and it also received a sizable amount of funding through the capital improvements projects that were funded um, by the community um, this year. Um, so that project went very well, and I, you know, I think we, we have every expectation that we'll, it's going to really enhance our ability to uh, promote the digital learning that we want to yeah. do in, in now when, elementary schools. What about the E-rate funds? Do we have to apply for that now? Yes. Yeah, that's no. been that's been, that's happened. Okay. So this Mass IT, the state was also responsible for actually applying for that on behalf of us. So I've actually reviewed their their their, their claim, and that, that's been submitted. So we will get we will see at some point next year, February March timeframe, about. Um, Sixty-two thousand dollars will come in through E-rate. So how does that work? We've we pay. Did we already get the grant money, or we get the grant money later? We already too? got the grant money. So the grant money um, was kind of offsetting the cost of the, the total cost of the project. Right. The local match was a little over one hundred and seven thousand dollars. So we actually wired those funds to Mass IT, the, mm -hmm. the state, and they're actually paying the vendor, the award vendor, and then that those funds, the E-rate funds once received, will, will come back and flow to, back into the town. Okay. It'll help offset the cost. So it's a net impact of like four, you know, $42,000 project. It's amazing yeah. how much it really project costs and what we're able to right. exactly. get it done for. It is. Um, the computer devices for the um, traditional kind of, well, in this year now, the Chromebooks with the one-to-one -one, uh, uh, program that we're implementing um, were ordered last week, Michael? Was it last yeah. week they were ordered? So yeah. um, we expect yeah. them, you know, in time for the delivery, and we have the rollout coming in August. We're actually doing a little something different that kind of came about as, as part of the, the parent orientation meeting, the original meeting back in June. Um, somewhat of a fundraiser, but I think also you know, serve a dual purpose here is um, we've ordered um, protective cases, sleeves, and we're working to have the um, the North Reading logo, kind of that tradition of the college NR with the corner in the middle of it. Um, you know, we thought that that might be fun for the kids too to um, to have and kind of personalize their device. And and we're ordering those. We've actually ordered the, the cases. I'm working with a, a local person to uh, to do the silk screening, and they're going to be sold as as a fundraiser. And I think I I think I think virtually everyone's going to want to buy one because I think it just kind of adds to the whole you know kind of. Program, I guess, of the of the excitement of the. What was the outcome? What was the outcome of the of the uh, protection plans? Uh, we're actually going with a um, with an insurance. We 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 got some good uh, a good lead. Um, actually, we got a good lead from Liam O'Connell, yeah, uh, the school committee's attorney. But Dan Downs had already investigated it previously, and it's it's a very it's an optional insurance program for for parents. And we're going to be opening up a portal very soon that they can go in. In fact, I saw an email since we've been in this yeah, meeting tonight yeah, yeah. Um, from the person that we've been working with that they'll have the option to purchase the insurance, which is roughly $15 a year yep. as a yeah. protection. So again, we're going to be strongly recommending that. Yes, um, theft. Yeah, it's theft, damage. damage, theft, damage. You know, liquid and, damage. And this is a company that, this is like a specialty of, if you go on their website, it's like this is, this is something that, this is what they do, right? So, um, so we think that's a good thing. Um, and we expect that, I think a lot of folks will probably want to sign on for that because it's a pretty low cost um, and then the last thing is the um, the bachelor school um, entrance repairs the Peabody Street entrance um, Wayne Hardica has been working to obtain quotes uh, along with Michael for the masonry work the kind of the column work and such and we expect that those quotes have been received mm -hmm. the money's been encumbered and we expect that that project will um, we'll start in earnest in August, and I, I think we're anticipating that to be completed by the opening of school, oh, yeah. Michael, would you yeah. agree? So um, that'll be, a, I think, a, a pretty significant upgrade to that to that, that front entrance, so-called front entrance on Peabody Street of the Batchelder School. Quick question. Jerry mentioned the baseball fence. Will that be coming down soon? Uh, I, I do know that it was it, was, it is temporary. Right. It's here, I think, for the summer ball, but I, I, I don't I don't have an exact date. I can try to find that. I'm out. just wondering because soccer will start like the third yeah, week of August. Right. So. Yeah, I mean that I think will all be coordinated with. Yeah. You know, I, I'm expecting that. And also, it's probably good to know. Some of you know this, but not everybody. But there's, I know that some folks weren't thrilled about the screen. You know, the kind of the black yeah. screen. You know, I think people on if, when you're in the at the game inside, watching the looks, game, yeah. you like it from the inside more than you do from. I think people got used to, and I, I'm I'm one of them driving by, and you kind of saw what was going on. But the screen that's there is actually not the screen that was originally requested or ordered, and the one that. Uh, but the company told the baseball coach that, um, you know, keep that one. We'll we'll replace it with the one that you ordered. So I think next year it's a little bit more. I don't know how much, but it was. It, he told me that it was designed to be more, well, like more see-through. Just too bad see -through. there were so many people that were, seemed annoyed by it. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
I heard a little bit about it. Not much, but I did hear a little bit about it, too. One other question, and I've gotten this question a couple times in the last two weeks. The tree stumps at the turf field that yeah. are off, is there any way we could get rid of those? I mean, I suppose the answer is yes, but there's a cost associated with it. Well, I was wondering if like the ground, DW could ground do it. Yeah. Well, when we cut those down, we told people they were going to grow back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if that's something the DPW could do. That, that's all. I, I'm sure they must have the they equipment, would right? Charge us. Have would they charge us. It have would be a cost yeah, to, to grind it. Yeah. All right. Charge us. We can investigate it, certainly. I don't think it's yeah. worth spending a lot of money on. I just was wondering if there was some way to. <laughs> they cut those pretty low. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, it emerged with a letter in the paper, right? Yeah, and then someone mentioned to me last years. week. Yeah. They've been down for, what, seven years? Yeah. Like that. that was Jim, I think, Jim Karen. The only thing I would, I would add, Mr. Webster, for Mr. Bernard, I just think it's, it's important to recognize when somebody does something good and steps up, and I think when I read in the transcript that you've been elected the president of oh. the <laughs> Merrimack Valley Superintendents Association, I think Thank that's you. an honor for you and for North Reading to be represented. Mm. And so. I Thank just you. think, I think you're a good, you do well at rep at recognizing people that <laughs> take on roles and do things. So I think it's important to recognize you as well for your work. I think it's a great honor. I was really confused when I read the paper. <laughs> and being from the Merrimack Valley, I was extremely confused. To see that North Reading was Right. I didn't know, I never knew North Reading was in the Merrimack Valley until I read that. Yeah, the, the boundaries, I will admit, the boundaries are strange. We go as far as, you know, Air Shirley. Is a member to Stoneham and what about what about Aaron towns like both Middlesex County? Right? What about towns like Mar um, yeah, Middleton it's, it's, and Boxford? Are they in Merrimack Valley no, or they're in the North Shore? We're on the North Shore. Table. Amesbury's in the North Shore Round Table. Uh, oh, Amesbury's not in the Merrimack Valley? No. That's weird. That's George, really weird. Georgetown is in the North Shore Round That's Table. That's strange. So the boundaries got drawn. We have 63 members. They were gerrymandered. Well, Superintendent. Mr. Bernard wanted to win. So. Yeah, they were. <laughs> John <laughs> drew the district to make sure there he was, got There wasn't a lot of competition. There wasn't a third ballot. John redrew the district and nobody else ran. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank right. you. Anything else? We need to take a picture. Yes. Do you want to go through meetings or not? No. Without my tie. No. All right. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, no. You have the meetings. meetings or not? Future meetings. Subcommittee and future meetings. Subcommittee. I mean, do we really have to go over all that? Like, come on. We want to see if you get it's just two, I think, isn't it? There is the uh, our next meeting next is oh, yeah. our next meeting is August 28th. No. Our goal is no. workshop. No, the 27th. No, and the then 27th. the superintendent's conference room at 4:30 to whatever, and we have to meet. Mr. Bernard requested that I get up early on <laughs> Thursday morning <laughs> for a 9 a.m. for a 9 a.m. meeting. That's after our 7 a.m. sub subcommittee meeting. Sure. So. I know that's <laughs> insane. We have a meeting July 27th, so really this Thursday at 9 a.m. The August 28th, I mentioned, 4 o'clock, 4.30 at 6.30, uh, opening day meeting we talked about. And then our first regular meeting in September is September 11th here at 6.30, the week after school opens. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed?